Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, to have a warm welcome to those attending and viewing, viewers watching live on Council's YouTube channel, Hillingdon, London. I hope you've all had a lovely summer and uh, we're having the first meeting after the summer. My name is Councillor Henry Higgins. I'm the chairman of this committee. Uh, details of business are to be considered today are shown on the agenda, copies of which are accessible in the room and under the live broadcast. For those present in the room and intend to speak, please note that you will be filmed and any statement that you make will be recorded and made public. I remind anyone speaking today that your voice will only be audible online if the microphone is switched on. We're not expecting any fire alarm, so if the fire alarm does go off, please follow officers out of the building. If those have, people have mobiles and tablets, can you please switch them off? Uh, the councillors on the committee will be using their laptops during the meeting to review agendas and paperwork. Uh, first, we go to the attendees. Before I move on to the agenda, I'd like to introduce the councillors and officers present. Councillor Darren Davis, Councillor Gohill, Councillor Cawthorn, Councillor Mand, and Councillor Singh. Welcome. Uh, and who make this committee complete are the officers, Kate Crosby, our Area and Planning Service Manager, Max Smith, our Planning Team Leader, Hayden Richards, our planning, Principal Planning Officer, Nisha Burnham, our Principal Planning Officer, Anna Griffith, Griffiths, is that correct? It's nice to meet you. I don't think we ever, I think we've talked on the phone, but we've never seen you. Welcome to the committee. I oh, was it? Well done. Well, there you go. I hope I'm not too scary. Uh, uh, so, <laughs> thank you very much. Sahara Ashad, uh, a legal advisor, welcome. And uh, Jimmy Walsh, I like, I like the name Jimmy, that's nice. <laughs> and Steve Clark, who is my right hand and who will kick me under the table if I'm doing something wrong. So, anyway, so what we're going to do. We'll have apologies for absence first, uh, Steve, for me. Okay, so this evening we've received apologies for absence from Councillor Tubidar, with Councillor Cawthorn substituting, and also uh, apologies from Councillor Sansapuri. Okay, welcome Councillor Cawthorn, thank you for stepping in. Um, any declarations of interest matters be coming before this meeting? Yes, Councillor Cawthorn. Thank you, Chairman. In respect of Agenda Item 10, uh, as a ward councillor, I've uh, made representation on this application and previous application on this side. I will therefore recuse myself from this item, leave the room while it's been considered. Thank you very Thank you. much. Uh, can, do we agree to sign and receive the minutes of the previous meeting? Is that agreed? Oh, oh sorry, okay. Councillor Manning. Agenda Man. item 6, Chairman. Yep. I've got a written statement as a ward councillor, so I'll be leaving well, the room for that. Well, that won't be read, read out. So it's, it's a new statement we've received. Yeah. Sorry, a statement we received on behalf of all the Pinkwell Ward councillors. So for that item, it was received from okay. Councillor Gill. Fine. Um, but for that item, we'll ask Councillor Mann to recuse himself from the room. Okay, so it was, um, can I, just one second, sorry. Uh, Councillor Mandel, what, what we, um, excuse me, forgive me in the audience, uh, the committee, we, we tried to run the committee in an open forum and, and, and it's a clear, clear plan. Thing. So if, if you are um, a councillor and you wish to speak on an item, um, then you are not allowed to sit on the committee. Okay? A written response is like speaking on an item. So the only way that I can allow you to remain on the committee is if you withdraw your name from that petition. From the written statement, which is a petition, so it's up to you. Okay, so you can put that written statement on behalf of the, the other two, which is fine. Yep. Okay, and, and again, you would leave the room as we as we deal with the meeting. Yeah, that's fine. Um, sorry about that. Anyway, so where I was, yeah, can we so agree to minutes? Uh, uh, matters that have been notified in advance or urgent, none at all. Uh, to confirm that any items in business marked one will be considered in public. All items are pub part one, so they're all uh, in part one. There's no part two items at all. Um, and also, I just want to make sure that uh, the audience realise this is a public meeting, okay? Uh, not held in, what's the, what's the correct term, Steve? Is it, it's a public meeting, but not... <laughs> 
but not for anything yeah, in the public. meeting held in public. public, but not a public meeting. Thank you. Fair enough. So I've got my, I've got it twisted around. It's the heat. That's our excuse <laughs> for the excuse. So I think I've covered all bases now. Yes, Councillor Gohill. Just to say, um, I agree to the previous minutes. That was that yeah. you've. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I took that. I thought everybody waved their hands. I'm oh, sorry about that. Oh, God, I've, I've missed not being here for over a month, haven't I? Uh, OK, so what we're going to do is start, start, start away. Uh, item 6, the garages on Grandford Park Drive. Hayes, um, Hayden, would you like to take us away? Thank you, Chair. Okay, so um, item six refers to garages at Camford Drive in Hayes. The application seeks planning permission to erect four two-bedroom houses following the demolition of the existing garages at the site. In terms of location, the development site is located just off of Carfax Road. To the north of the site, you have Cranford Drive and the properties on Cranford Drive. To the south, you have a recreation ground, and beyond that, you have the M4. In terms of constraints, to the south of the site, as you can see on the plan, you have the green belt, and other than that, there are no notable constraints for the development site. Uh, here is the proposed floor plans. As you can see, four houses are proposed. They're uniform in terms of their L-shaped design. Each of the four houses is going to have a parking space in compliance with the London plan standards. In terms of internal floor space, um, each of them would also meet the London plan standards and would also have adequate external amenity space. Um, at first floor, you would have a window facing toward the rear elevations of properties on Cranford Drive. I know that some residents raised concerns about a loss of privacy and perhaps overlooking. However, that window does serve a hallway and it would also be obscure glazed via condition as set out in the officer's report. Concerns were also raised about a loss of light from the proposed development on properties on Cranford Drive. However, a day in sunlight assessment was submitted by the applicant and the assessment has confirmed that there would be no harmful or significant loss of light to those residents on Cranford Drive. In terms of its visual impact, the properties are part single, part two story in terms of their design. Uh, there are other properties in the area which vary in design. You have some single story, some two story. The material palette varies. Uh, some are contemporary, some are not contemporary. So uh, we feel that visually the dwellings would be in keeping with the character and appearance of the area. I think taking into consideration all of those points, we will be recommending the application for approval subject to conditions. I'm now going to run you through some visuals of the site. So here's a bird's eye view. As I was saying, to the south of the site, we've got a recreation ground and the green belt, and beyond that, the M4. To the north, we've got Cranford Drive. Uh, the development site itself is accessible off Carfax Road, which is to the right of the site. This is the view from Cranford Drive toward the development site. This is the view from Carfax Road into the development site. This is the view from within the site at the moment. So as you can see, these are the 24 garages that are going to be demolished and replaced by the four houses. This is the rear elevations or, sorry, rear boundary treatments of properties on Cranford Drive. These are the rear elevations of properties on Cranford Drive. This is the access off Wilkins Close to the development site, so it would be accessible from Carfax Road and Wilkins Close uh, via foot. This is to the south of the site, so this is the recreation ground which separates the rear of the development site from the M4. As you can see, there are some trees along the boundary. Some of those trees are going to be removed. It will be the uh, category C trees, so the two that you can see in this picture here, which will be removed to facilitate the development. And then this large tree here, which is category B, I believe, is going to be protected, and there are tree protection measures set out in the arboricultural report, so I don't have any worries about that tree being damaged um, significantly or removed. And a condition is on there to also ensure that if there is any significant damage, that the tree would be replaced. Next, there's some property types in the area and some other building types. As you can see, 
There are some terraces which are sort of finished in brick. They're two-storey. There's also a bungalow showing that there's different scale of buildings in the area. In the top right is a community building which is on the left-hand side as you come into Carfax Road. The building is finished with a gable end similar to the houses which are being proposed. It's got a contemporary design in terms of cladding, render, mixture of brick similar to the properties that are being proposed. And on the bottom right you've got some other properties on the road which vary and um, I guess the purpose of this slide is to show that the area has a mixed character and a mixed appearance and that the houses that we're putting forward would fit in with that character. So um, yeah, as mentioned earlier on, we will be recommending it for approval subject to the conditions set out in the officer's report. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Hayden. Um, okay, um, we have a, a petition, um, hard dip chand Asama. I think I pronounced that right. If I haven't, forgive me. Um, you will have five minutes, sir, when you press the red button. Um, and then you have a traffic light screen, so it'd be green for four. When you get one, uh, it'd be amber and then red. I will stop you, so forgive me. I will, I will be firm. Just come in there. Sorry, yeah, can we get Councillor Mann back in? No, no, no. Oh, not yet. Sorry. Just to let Hayden know, um, there's five slides submitted by the petitioner, so if you just press next when he asks for the next slide. Thanks. Okay. So whenever you're ready. Good evening, committee members. Uh, I'll start with the privacy of the current residents of Rentwood Park. It is disregarded with the two-story building being built straight after the boundary of the current houses on the Rentwood Drive, and only leaving space of 1.5 meters alleyway for pedestrian access, as you'll see in slide one and slide two. Slide two, please. This narrow alleyway is going to be used as the main entrance by the new residents and also shared by the current residents. There would be a const constant overlooking and privacy issue at the back end, affecting the residents to great extent. Again, this is breach of DMC 6 of Hillingdon Local Council, part 2, in respect of garden and back end development. As you will see in the plan, as well as in slide 3, various trees in the gardens of the current residents will be encouraging the newly created alleyway to be shared by the uh, new and the current residents. The canopies of the trees are even going further, encouraging the boundaries of the new properties to be built. This will lead to conflicts and cutting of trees. Sorry, sir, the microphone that you're using isn't turned on at the moment. Sure. This will lead to conflicts and cutting of trees. Again, this is breach of DM6 rules affecting the neighboring residential gardens and amenity rights. If the current residents are forced to cut their existing trees, this is again the, against the basic right to live. There is an error in calculating the loss of daylight and sunlight affecting the neighboring residential amenities because the point of 25 degree angle as seen in slide 4 is resting at the back end. Uh, slide 4 please. So the 25 degree angle is resting at the back end of the main building of the house number 178 and not at the boundary of the house. So the area including the large outbuilding as seen in slide 5. Can we have slide 5? And the south-facing garden is totally ignored. Can we go back to slide? So you can see the 25 degree angle is starting at the back end of the house. And even in there, we, we, the outbuildings are totally ignored, as I shown in slide 5. Again, 178 and 180 are having smallest extensions. You see, uh, if you look at the planning map, we have got other houses we have, which has got larger extensions. So ideally, it, the loss of light should be measured from the houses which has got the available largest extension, and we have got windows over there. Again, there is the third point is the loss of seven mature trees. Replanting them is going to take age, and we have got limited number of trees over there. And the distance between the motorway and the current development is just 40 meters. Imagine us losing seven mature trees. And we have got school next to it, Cranford Park Academy. So it's going to affect in every way. Now I'd uh, like to highlight the quality of the life of the new residents. So we have got less than 60 square meters of outer space because of the limited availability of the space. And here the planning officer is counting, disregarding this criteria by including the space in the public park which is next to the development again this is breach of dm6 rules uh, if we go to slide four we have got 
set of large double doors facing this recreational garden. This, this is going to be clear all looking at the recreational park. So resident, new residents, their quality of life, as well as the members of the public in the park, they will be affected by this. Uh, level of noise and traffic. If committee members, they do a visit, then they'll see that close proximity of the motorway is just 40 meters away and it's exceeding 65 decibels easily. So we are already compromised here in terms of traffic as well as noise pollution. We have got E6 bus running on the other end, which is running from 5 a.m. to 1 a.m., 15 minutes. And plus we have got Cranford Park Academy uh, school traffic. So all in all, we, have, we are congested from north side. On east side, there's place of worship, which was denied the extended hours for the very reason of overcrowding and traffic issues and noise pollution. So how come this large development be considered? The rules should be equal for every resident. Even Wilkins Close, number one, was denied the application on basis of the loss of daylight and sunlight. Same things are ignored over here. Again, Pinkville Ward is seeing overcrowding. We have got 1,000 plus new homes being built in this ward. And Cranford Park Academy is at less than 200 meters away from this new development, plus the existing houses. It's going to be a highly overcrowded area. So on the east side, we have got place of worship. On the north side, and parking is not given to visitors. So there is clear parking issue. There is E6 bus route running. There is school next to it. And the only entrance to this is through place of worship. Thank you. That's, uh, we've got a new, new buzzer. I didn't, we haven't had that before, have we? I'll Thank put you. This on Happy to take any questions. Yes, that's fine. I'm just going to ask, uh, is there anybody who would like to ask any questions of the uh, petitioner? Yes, Councillor Corkman. Thank you sir, for your, your presentation. Sorry, I had to rush. Thank you. Um, I, I'm just I wonder if you, if you just repeat um, what it was you were saying about overlooking, specifically how you affect it, how you believe it will impact in that regard, please. Sure. So we have got little gardens, and there, there's this little alleyway, which is going to be there, serving as the main entrance for the residents, for the new residents. So existing residents, they have got this little garden, as you'll see in that uh, map. The, uh, you know where the 25 degree angle is? It's measured from the outbuilding and not from the boundary of the site. So not only is there a privacy issue, there's little alleyway. We have got trees, as you will see in the pictures, they are already encroaching the properties. Plus privacy, constant walking of people over there. The garages were not in use since decades as accepted by the councils. Little alleyway, you are giving that as a main entrance. And plus it is shared by the current residents, so constant flow of people walking through there and clear oversight issues over there. Thank you. Plus, there, sorry, can I add to that? Yes, sir. Uh, there's oversight issues for the members of the public using the park. You can see there are a large set of double doors plus the windows over there. And then we are using this recreational place for uh, members of the public being used. So there would be oversighting from that end as well. So at both sides, there is a ni little narrow alleyway to enter the space where there is oversight for 22 plus houses. On the other end, there is this recreational garden. I mean, uh, in the whole of the borough, I've never seen houses at such close proximity of garden facing all the windows over there and large set of double doors. Thank you very much. Uh, can you turn the microphone off for me, please? Sure. Uh, committee, I'll get some of those questions answered after we've had the petitioners and, and everything else. So, uh, you'd like to take a seat? Thank you, sir. Sorry, can, uh, sorry. Can, do you want to ask? Sorry, you'd like to come back? Sorry, come sit down. Sorry, Councillor Singh, I didn't. I, I did look over. I didn't see you indicate. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Adip. Uh Why do you think uh, cutting off trees is so important for you? Sir, we have got, you know, 40 metres away is the motorway, yeah? and these trees are only protection for us from air pollution. Now these trees are mature trees. If, if we were to cut them off, it will take an age to replant and get them matured over there. We have got a num limited number of trees over there. So if, if you guys do a site visit, you will clearly see that we, we have got very limited protection and motorway is constantly used 24-7. You will see noise as well as air pollution clearly felt over there. The schools it itself is at very close proximity from, from the development site. It, it will affect in all sorts. 
plus okay. uh, you know cutting of trees of y you'll see that if you bring this slide uh, in terms of how the uh, the proposed development is there. The canopies of the mm -hmm. trees are already encroaching not only the alleyways, but they are encroaching the boundaries of the new development. Mm -hmm. So obviously new residents, they won't like this, that a tree's canopy is flowing into their g garden. So we will be bound to cut the trees. I mean, there would be co constant conflicts between new residents and old residents. Because A, they have got small alleyway to walk through. And, and cutting of trees would be required for clear view of the alleyways. Plus, you can't have trees going into the boundaries of someone's houses. So clearly, there, 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 is, there are issues over there. Plus, air pollution, noise pollution, all sorts of things. We've got very li limited number of trees. Thank you very much. Can you now, further question? Can, go on, uh, Thank you, Faj. You already explained about the traffic. Uh, how are you current uh, residents affected by the traffic? I, I understand you mentioned. Could you give me more detail? Like you said, E5 buses go yeah, there so from we, 5 to yeah, late so or churches close there. Sure, and sure. The school as well. so, so the way the traffic is affected, we have got E6 bus, which yeah. is running almost 24 hours, since from 5 a.m. to 1 a.m. Mm -hmm. every 15 minutes. We have got already parking issues at the moment. We have got place of worship over there which was denied extended operational hours because of the traffic issue only on the east side because there is limited space to park and many a times what happens is that bus cannot go through because of limited number of parking space. Now four residential homes, these are two bedroom houses, plus there is no visitors car park in measure in place. So there is no uh, place for visitors to park. What's going to happen is they would be parking on the street and we have got limited park parking space because of traffic of the school, because of the E6 bus route, because of already congested area, because of place of worship in operational, plus they are operating food bank as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you turn the microphone off, please? Thank you. Sure. Thank, Thank you, you Kathy. Can you turn your microphone off as well, please? Can you take a seat? Thank you. Uh, can I have the applicant agent, either, is it Jason McKenzie or Peter Kearns here? You'd like to state who you are, sir, and you know the rules that you've been here many times. So, Hello there, yeah. My, my name is P P Peter Kearns. I'm the owner and director of Kearns Development. Um, on this uh, ap application, uh, is everything all right? Uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, I'm just going to uh, touch on a few of the points that have been raised by the petitioner, and I'll start off by with tra traffic issues, if I may. A car par parking space is provided for each house. Secure cycle parking is provided in each garden. As highlighted in the planning officer's report, pr providing four spaces is in accordance with the Lon Lon London plan policies. The planning officer in his report also confirms that the Highways Authority has no objection to this application. Daylight and sunlight. Our architect has carefully designed the proposed to ensure no undue daylight and sunlight impact on the Cranford Road prop properties. The drawings are all there to be seen. The development is part single storey and one and a half storey elements set away from the north boundary. We have arranged a specialist daylight and sunlight study as, as, as requested by Hillington Planning and it has confirmed that there will not be any undue impact on the surrounding properties. Fire and emergency ser services. All existing dwellings around the site front onto public roads accessible to fire and emergency vehicles. O oversight issues. The development is designed to avoid impact on surrounding residents. Each dwelling has only one first floor win win window facing Cranford Drive properties, which is to a hallway, which is also obscure glass. The planning officer's report confirms overall the proposed development would have an acceptable impact on the amenities of the neighbouring properties. 
The report also goes on to point out the development, the development is li likely to have a positive impact by reducing the likelihood of antisocial behaviour on this site. Recreation ground and open space. The site is cur cur currently fully occupied by hard standing and garages. The proposed site layout allows a significant proportion of the land coverage will be changed to trees, communal planting and gardens. Su suitable species to encourage wildlife habitat will be incorporated in communal planting areas and will positively uplift the ecology of the site. The, pla excuse me. the planning officer's report confirms the proposal has an acceptable ecological impact. The cutting of trees. The proposal includes new trees and planting. The planning officer's report con confirms the borough's tree of officers considers the proposal acceptable. And one thing current development doesn't do is cut trees. I'm dead against it. Impact on the character and appearance of the, of, of the area. With respect to this matter, the officer's report is very complementary and states the proposed dwellings are designed to complement the traditional brick properties that characterise the area. The new properties would be in keeping with the mixed character of the area. The part single, part story side uh, design reduces their massing, ensuring that they are somewhat subservient to frontage properties on Cranford Drive. Overall, it is considered the proposal would, be, would constitute an improvement to the visual amenities of the immediate area. Is that my time? No, you won't. One minute, minute quickly. The comfort privacy. The size of the dwellings and their gardens exceed the London Plan recommended minimum sizes. The officer's report indicates a condition will be applied which will ensure the construction will include special me measures to mitigate noise from the motorway. And I will finish on this. I've been at many of these planning committees. A lot of people have objected to our, our planning. But when we finish them, everybody, everybody, bar no, no site, has said, what an improvement to the site. I leave it to them. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? I have a question. Oh. Um, are you um, going to replace those trees? We're not going to cut down any trees presently. Yeah. Oh yes, there are two down, and uh, we are replacing uh, them. And, and they will be with semi-mature. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much, and uh, I'll let that be that. Anybody else? No. Thank you very much. Thank Mr. you. Th thanks, Thank you. Thanks for your time. No, my pleasure. Okay, we have written representation from Councillor Gill and from Councillor Lechmana. Okay. Okay, so this is the statement from Councillor Gill and Councillor Lackmana as Pinkwell Ward Councillors. We wish to express our full support for the petition submitted by the residents of Cranford Drive. Our endorsement is based on several compelling reasons. Privacy concerns. The proposed construction of two-storey houses directly adjacent to the current residences on, on Cranford Drive, with only a 1.5-metre alleyway in between, poses a significant threat to the privacy of existing and future residents. This disregards policy DMH6 of the Hillingdon Local Plan Part 2 regarding garden and backland development, which aims to preserve privacy. Second point is tree encroachment. The presence of trees within the gardens of current residents encroaches upon the shared alleyway slash main entrance used by new residents. Conflicts over these trees and potential removals could disrupt the peace and privacy of the current residents, infringing upon their rights. Daylight and sunlight loss. Residents believe there's an error in calculating the loss of daylight and sunlight, as the angle measurement seems to overlook the south-facing back gardens, resulting in inaccurate assessments. Even with the current measurements, a marginal breach has been acknowledged. Further houses, uh, 178 and 180, have smaller extensions, making the impact of daylight and sunlight more substantial for other properties. Tree remo removal and air quality. The proposal to cut seven mature trees and replant new ones may negatively impact air quality, especially in an area comprised, uh, compromised by pollution, especially concerning the nearby primary school. 
Fire and emergency access. The narrow alleyway of 1.5 metres raises concerns about delayed fire and emergency access, with sprinkler systems not being sufficient to cover the potential risks as the old houses lack them. Increased noise and traffic. The development could lead to increased noise and traffic, which has already caused issues on the nearby motorway and bus route E6, affecting both current and new residents, as well as Cranford Park Academy. Overcrowding. Given the ongoing development of approximately 1,000 new homes in the Punkwell Ward, further strain on public roads and schools is expected. The limited parking spaces for new houses and the shared entrance with the place of worship and food bank exacerbate the overcrowding issues. Quality of life for new residents. New residents are allocated less than 60 square metres of outdoor space, which is below the requirement. The reliance on a nearby public park not owned by the developer to meet this requirement raises concerns about privacy and adequacy of private outdoor spaces. In light light of these substantial concerns, we urge the Planning Committee to thoroughly consider the case presented by our residents before making any decisions. We hope that these valid points will be taken into account for the benefit of the community's well-being. Thank you, Steve. Um, I'm going to get officers to answer a few questions before we go to the committee, if that's okay with you. Um, we got uh, daylight and sunlight. I know that in the report uh, that's being done after the event, so we need to talk about that. Question of how many trees are being removed. Um, the distance between the back of the new property and the existing properties. Uh, obviously, if the trees are going to be replaced depending if it's seven, then they're replacing seven mature trees. Um, and is there fencing on the back of the property so it doesn't run straight into the recreation ground? You got all those? So which ones? You going to take some of those, Hayden? Uh, yeah, of course. <coughs> okay, so um, firstly, I'll address the concerns raised about privacy. Um, When you're in that alleyway, the alleyway is 1.5 metres wide, as pointed out by the petitioners. However, if you're within that alleyway and you're at ground level and you're walking through the alleyway, to your right-hand side you would have the new houses, to the left-hand side you would have the rear fences of every house on Cranford Drive. So unless you're two metres plus, then you would not be able to see into the rear gardens or the rear windows of any of those properties. Um, As pointed out in the presentation, in terms of first floor windows, you've got a hallway which would be in the new houses. However, that hallway window would be obscure glazed, so you wouldn't have any overlooking or privacy issues that I'm aware of. I think it's also worth noting that it is existing garages at the moment, and if someone were to walk along the back of there in the same instance as it being a walkway or an alleyway as proposed, you could still you'd still be looking into the boundary fences so there wouldn't be any sort of increase because if you are trying to access the 24 or 22 garages you could also still look toward the boundary fences of those houses or at the back of Cranford Drive. Um, In terms of trees, uh, seven trees are going to be removed and four are going to be replaced. Uh, If necessary we could amend the condition to make sure that we can get the additional trees which have been asked for. Okay, so it's five trees which are being proposed. So there's a off, um, two deficit of two. So we could add two additional in the landscaping plan. Yeah, Hayden, and, the, and, and those trees are uh, the ones that uh, are very maximum effective against pollution as well, aren't they? Yes, they are. So I, pro- I, pro- I, won't, I won't present committee, but I think we'll be going for seven. Okay, fine. And yes. then we've got the daylight and sunlight issue. Yep, so um, in terms of day and sunlight, I did point out during the process of the application that there was a breach in the 25 degree line. Um, You can see it, it's very marginal, it's the very top of the gable end. Um, Because of the breach, I did want an additional professional assessment to come forward to say if there would be a loss of light to those neighbours or any significant overshadowing, and the report that we've received shows that there would be no significant loss of light or no significant overshadowing. And for that reason, and despite the minimal breach of the line, I think that the development is okay in terms of loss of light uh, to neighbouring properties. Uh, I think it's also worth noting that that breach is at the very top of the gable. It's not as if it's the the full width of the house, it's just the peak where it breaches. So the actual uh, impact on shadowing would be very, very minimal, um, as opposed to if it was the middle of the house where it was breaching. It's a very, very marginal breach. Um, In terms of comments were raised about the narrowness of the alleyway, 
uh, the alleyway is 1.5 metres, as pointed out by the petitioners, and uh, 1.5 metres is sufficient to have a person, a bike, anyone who needed to get round there to, to, to say get to the back garden to move bins or anything like that. So we feel that the alleyway is accessible. Um, in terms of traffic, comments were raised about uh, an increase in traffic. As I said, at the moment, there's 24, 24 garages at the site. So if all of those garages were in use, and I'm sure they were in use at some point in time, otherwise they are unlikely to have been there, uh, that would generate much more traffic than having the four car parking spaces that are proposed. So I can't see there being any increase in traffic at the site. Um, and I think that covers all of your points, unless you had yeah. something more. Yeah, sorry. On the alleyway, uh, Hayden, is it got fencing on both sides? Is it? Yeah, so um, okay. on one side you would have the rear of the properties on Cranford Drive, so unless all residents decided to remove their back fences and have open plan back gardens, then uh, there should otherwise be fences. And on the other side of that, there would be the brick walls as shown on on the elevation plans, on uh, north elevation here. Okay. And the fence on, onto the... Um amenity area, the recreation ground, there's a fence there, I should assume it doesn't Yeah, there's a, there's a wall there at the moment and there is no plans to demolish that wall as far as I can see on the suggested plans and if there were, it would be covered by putting a fence in between the recreation ground. Okay. I think those are all the points that were in the petition. So, um, Councillor Gohill, you want to start? Thanks, Chairman. Um, I have two questions, if that's okay. Um, I'll start with the first one, which is to do with these trees or the green wall, so to say. Um, on page 31, the air quality officer uh, wrote, I recommend negotiating with the applicant the deployment of a green wall to act as a physical barrier from the motorway traffic emission, location to be agreed with LBH, Lundborough of Hillingdon. Um, has this location been agreed? Is that the trees that we're talking about? And if it hasn't been agreed, can we make it agreed. part of the... <laughs> yeah, can we, can, we make it, can we ensure that it's agreed prior to construction? Uh, the details for where this green wall will be sited are set out in the landscaping condition, so they wouldn't be able to install the green wall without prior, I guess, uh, consent from the council. And in terms of locations, there are several places where it could be taken into consideration the side of the south, on the south boundary, close to the recreation ground. I suppose, I suppose it, uh, yeah, so just to confirm, it will be, it will be agreed. Yeah, it will be agreed, yeah. Cool. Um, and my second question was just about access for emergency vehicles. Um, 1.5 metres isn't too wide. Um, I, I think from a previous council meeting, we, we saw that the, the length, the width of a, of a fire engine, for example, is over two metres. Um, would they be able to fit through? Is there a way for emergency um, vehicles to access if necessary? I believe that in terms of emergency vehicles, you have Carfax Road, which is directly to the development site where I'm assuming a uh, going on the size of the road and mm. its existing sort of ability to allow people to go into the community centre as well as the new parking spaces that a fire engine could be placed on that road. But also for the properties that exist on Cranford Drive, there is the main road on Cranford Drive, so anyone or sorry, any emergency service vehicle that wanted to get to those property would just use Cranford Drive as opposed to the rear of the sites. I hope that answers your question. I just want to confirm that those those houses in the middle, if there were, you know, touch with nothing ever happens, but if there were something awful to happen right. to them at the top, that, that emergency vehicles would, <coughs> would be able to get there. And uh, in the design and access statement, it does show that these properties, the new properties, would be served with sprinkler systems in the event that, like you said, the uh, the worst outcome happened. Okay, thank you. Councillor Singh. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, actually, um, I believe she already uh, asked the question about the emergency vehicle. And secondly, uh, what's the plan for refuse collections in front of the whole seas or have enough space for the rubbish collection lorries? Yeah, can someone come back on that one? Sorry, so as you can see on these plans, uh, refuse collection areas near to the cycle park, uh, sorry, near to the car parking spaces. So for those properties, you would, I guess, on collection day, move your bins from within the site to the collection area, which is next to the parking spaces. Uh, let me see if I can. Can you see that on the where my finger is? 
where the light is. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, another question? The uh, second question is um, the developer said if they cut two trees, we said five trees, so how many trees we make sure how many trees they have to replace? Seven, five, two? Seven. Seven. I'll make sure it's seven. So I don't know if any but I'll have to have it seconded, but so you can second it anyway. But we'll have seven trees. So whatever's taken out we'll make sure it's put back. Councillor Davis. Thank you, Chairman. Um, can I just get clarity on the refuge collection? So, um, all houses are going to be taking it to one point. Yeah. yeah, they're not going to be leaving it at the foot of their driveway. No. Okay. And um, my second point is relating to the sprinklers, and um, I couldn't see any any comment from the fire brigade. Have they been consulted? Because I couldn't see that in the report. Um, and my question would be, is it possible to add a sprinkler on the second floor of the property as well? Because from the report, I can see it's only on the ground floor. So I may be wrong, I may have missed it, but from what I can see, it's on the ground floor. And I'd be concerned that if there was a fire there, we would need a second level sprinkler. Okay, Hayden, would you like to try and pick that one up? Uh, first, I would probably say that for a development of this size and nature, it wouldn't be necessary to consult the fire brigade. That's the first point. Yeah. Um, in terms of the sprinklers itself, as far as I'm aware, um, the purpose of putting them at the ground floor is to stop them from spreading upward. Uh, all of those issues, however, are building control matters on the most part, so they wouldn't be covered by planning. Okay, any other questions? That's it. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Councillor Cawthorn. <coughs> Thank you. I've got a probably two or three, maximum three. But I'll, I'll uh, let you have three. Yeah. Generous of you, given it's our role to scrutinise on this committee, Chairman. So exactly. Thank you for that. Um, As if you have to ask. In Go respect ahead. of, um, yeah, I mean, I, I can quite see the policy imperative coming to increase the amount of housing in the borough. Uh, I, I, I think this is a legacy of the HRA pipe one that I had something to do with in Cabinet days many years ago. So I get that, and I can quite see how that will be impacting on the assessment of the planning balance in the eyes of the case officers. So that, that, that's all fair enough. And I, uh, and I can see there's an argument also for some betterment on site as, as well, uh, compared with what's there at the moment. I do think sometimes there is a, a feeling that we can be, perhaps be brushing aside a little too readily some of the concerns residents have raised, and I do think it's our job to scrutinise and understand fully uh, the officer response to those things. Well, I've got a couple of questions. Um, there was a point made about the loss of privacy, uh, and uh, there was some suggestion, I think, in the opening presentation that there are some glazed windows or a glazed window that, that, that's going in. So uh, can, I, can we just rerun that briefly so I can understand it properly? Because we went through that as a cancer yeah, to begin with. It's, it's the hallway. The hallway is the thing. Um, Hayden can bring it up and show you. Just look at that, please. Thank you. <coughs> Right, okay. Thank, thank, thank you for that. Um, second point is around this daylight uh, study that, that's been referred to, and we understand that that's a professionally uh, uh, conducted process which is normally pretty much a, of a showstopper when it comes to questioning, but can I just ask whether that is something that is in the public domain and can be seen? Is there anything to look at, or are we simply taking it that officers have seen it and they're happy with it? it, it's, it um, the written, obviously, is with officers, but the diagram at the bottom is showing Hayden. Would you like to point to that as well? That is the line for the shadowing. Okay. Okay. And my, thank you. My final final question is uh, uh, from page 32. The um, we've got a comment about two thirds of the way down about that raises a policy question in my head. That I just want to clarify. It talks about. Uh, the overall development complying with DMH6, and this is an exceptional case where backland development could be permitted. So do I take it from that that there is uh, a potential policy conflict and would there be a presumption against this kind of de development in other circumstances? Can I just clarify what, what the officers are saying there, in effect? You want to turn that game? Max? And I think in terms of backland development, so the um, policy itself, it sets out the criteria that we need to assess it against. I think because this is a brownfield site that's already got garages on it and hard standing, um, that has um, street access as well, that it is an appropriate site to redevelop subject to compliance with um, one, three to four of that policy, which has been covered off in the report. 
Corey B. Supplementary on that, if I may. Chairman. Of course you may. Uh, so, uh, given what's been said, I suppose the, uh, the other question that occurs to me is if, if, if we're departing from policy on the basis of what we were hearing, uh, is there a risk that it undermines that policy uh, in other respects and other places, I suppose, is my question. I, um, with regards to policy and compliance with policy DMH6, there is, in short, a, a requirement for buildings at the back of other buildings to be lower in scale, size, bulk, etc. And as you can see from the design of these, they are part single, they are part two story. They've also been designed with a gable end instead of a flush square end. So I think in terms of a policy or a, a departure from policy, um, I don't think there is one, although it might have been referred to slightly in the report. I think it was more the case of the officer trying to, I guess, put forward that these properties are two-story in terms of their height, size, scale, and bulk, but they are smaller properties than you would see on the front edge. So I don't think there is a departure from policy. And in terms of the other bits in policy DMH6, which refer to parking impacts on neighbours, those things have all been addressed in the report and in the presentation. Thank you. Can I okay, fine. Um, so I'm going to wind it up now. I think we've had a thorough debate there. Scrutinised enough, Councillor Cawthorn, I think. Um, there's a couple of things that's, that's what we're saying. We want the green wall, I believe, that's what you wanted. Um, we also want seven trees to be replaced, not five. I hope you're writing these down, Steve. Um, the only question, I think that's, that's it. The only thing, question I'm, I'm concerned about is the alleyway. Could it be somewhere that could be used for criminal activity or have we covered that one off with um, if we haven't I'd like to that to go to delegate it and come back to me if that's possible I think what I would say about criminal activity at the back of the site it is existing 24 garages which are unused so yeah, <laughs> there is so, so there is a potential for right. existing crime as well, well we I want to move it on just, yeah so if we have some sort of just have a look at it the, I mean that we have that department available to Fine. So those are the things. I, have I missed anything? Do I miss add anything else? No. On those on those bases, um, do I have a proposer? Yeah, Councillor Davis. Um, I'm I'm happy to go with officer's recommendation purely because the conditions that we've got set out and the risk factor that this could go to the mayor's office um, and could be approved anyway. So I'd rather have it in the London Borough of Hillenden Planning Committee approve so we can control the conditions and I think that would be best for the residents. Well said. So I have a proposer. Seconder, Councillor Garhill. I'm happy to second on that basis. Okay, and a seconder. Uh, those in favour of this officer's recommendation indicate... Oh, sorry, Councillor Singh. Uh, sorry, Chair, thank you. Uh, can we uh, do uh, side visit? Is it possible? No, I don't. I don't think it's necessary to be tried. It's up to committees. Anybody else want to have a side visit? No? No. 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 Sorry, mate. Uh, so that... Uh, any, anyway, you've got no one to second you, so it's going to be a bit difficult. But anyway, on that note, uh, can I have indication of those in favour of officer's recommendation uh, with those additionals that we have discussed? Yep. Those against? Thank you. So that's... Uh, Four, four and one against and uh, three. Um. Okay, before I move on, um, would like someone like to get Councillor yeah. Mand back okay. in, please? Back, Councillor Mann. Okay, so item seven, Kirk House, 97 High Street. That's yours again, I think, Hayden. I'm not sure if I can remember it after that. <laughs> okay, um. I'm sure. I'm sure you'll do a fantastic job. 
Okay, so uh, item 7 refers to Kirk House, 97 High Street in Usley. The application seeks planning permission to put in eight flats in the existing loft space of the existing building. The development site is located on the corner of Usley High Street and St Stephen's Road. To the north of the site is Chilton's House, which is another set of flats. To the east of the site is the main high street. To the south of the site is St Matthew's Church and St Matthew's Primary School. And to the west of the site is, or oh, sorry, are other properties on the road. In terms of constraints, there is a listed building to the south of the site, as you can see on the plan. It is the St Matthew's Church and there's another listed building on the other side of the road. The development site is also in a primary shopping area as it's part of Usley High Street. There are no other notable constraints for the proposed development. Uh, this is the existing site plan. Um, as you can see, you've got 44 parking spaces at the moment. 36 of those car parking spaces are going to be used by the existing residents and the remaining eight spaces would be used by the new residents so there wouldn't be any additional parking at the site the developers seek to utilize the existing parking which exists at the site uh, here's an existing roof plan of the building which is where the proposed development would be here are some existing elevations of the building showing its size design and also the undercroft area which is used for parking uh, here is a section plan just showing the internal ceiling to floor heights within the building as well as the undercroft parking area. In terms of its visual impact, here we have the proposed elevations. As you can see, there's going to be some dormers in the roof of the building. There'll also be some privacy screens and balcony areas for the new residents of the flats. The existing stairwell is going to be enlarged to allow for access up to that roof level. This is also in the event of a fire or anything like that, as residents will be able to get in and out safely. Um, we have another elevation plan here showing the also that the new flats would have appropriate internal floor to ceiling heights as well as, like I said, the undercroft parking which will be which is already there and will be used for the new residents. Here we have the floor plan um, showing the eight flats and the internal layouts. All residents of those new flats would have adequate access to light through windows and adequate outlook. They'd also all have um, balconies and amenity space. Here is another floor plan. This is showing the outlook of the development from those habitable windows within the flats. As you can see, there would be some long distance views towards the flats on Chilton House. I know that some concerns were raised by residents about overlooking toward the primary school to the south of the site. I think it's probably worth noting that the existing building has flats at first floor and second floor with habitable rooms which already look toward all of the neighbouring properties. So if we were to add additional residents into the roof of the building, there would be no significant increase in overlooking or privacy loss toward any neighbours because there are already really high level habitable windows which look toward all neighbouring sites. Uh, here's another section plan showing the internal floor to ceiling heights, followed by another one. Uh, and I guess taking into consideration the points that I raised about the minimal visual impact of the development because it's sited in the roof space of the building, uh, parking, there'd be adequate parking on site and we'd be utilising existing spaces in terms of neighbours and there'd be no loss of privacy or harmful loss of privacy due to the fact that there are existing windows looking towards all neighbours. All of the flats would provide good living accommodation for their new residents and for that reason we will be recommending the application for approval subject to conditions and a legal agreement which would restrict future residents from applying for parking permits. I'm just going to move on to now some visuals of the site so you have an idea of what we're talking about. Um, as I said, it's on the corner of Usley High Street and St Stephen's Road. This is the view of the site from across the road. This is the view of the church and to the rear of the church is the primary school that we were talking about and as I was saying there are a lot of windows on that east elevation which already look toward 
the church and already look toward the primary school and therefore already overlook those spaces and those neighbouring properties and residents. This is the view, the side elevation from St Stephen's Road showing the Undercroft parking area as well as those flats at first floor and second floor which look toward neighbours. Here we have another view which shows the existing car park and the Undercroft area and this view is south towards the other properties in St Stephen's Road. Uh, some I guess points were raised about dormers being an unusual feature in the road but as you can see from this there is a dormer on the back of that house which is very visible from the road and that is at a lower level than our dormer so our dormer would be much less visible from the road than the dormer that you can already see from the road so I don't think there'd any, be any harm to the character or appearance of the area. Uh, this is the existing stairwell and as I said um, we would be putting in a larger stairwell it would be a little bit higher um, obviously reaching up to the roof space to allow for safe access in and out of the building uh, there's also more images of the parking area uh, that's the undercroft parking as mentioned previously which will be used for um, for the parking that's a view um, toward the high street of the building and that's sort of a, a corner view which also shows the primary school which I was talking about at the rear and as mentioned um, earlier on these flats up here and those flats down there they all have rear facing windows so if we had that elevation they would be there and there and they already look into and onto the school so there would be no significant loss of privacy or overlooking of the school or of the church and uh, yeah for the reasons I guess mentioned in the officer's report and in the presentation, we are recommending this for approval subject to the conditions and to the legal agreement. Thank you, Hayden. Okay, so we've got a petitioner, Mary Redmond. Is there Mary here? Would you like to come and take a seat? It's like calling down from the price is right, isn't it? As you, I think you've seen, you have know, five minutes, green for four, amber was one, and then we, actually you have a beep now, so it's even more. I don't even have to say that anymore. I'll, after you, whenever you rent, press the red button. Yes, please. Thank you. When this and two previous rejected applications were made, Hayden Richardson was unaware there were leaseholders in KH, as the freeholder declared they were the sole owner of the building. A KH resident discovered the planning notice by accident, this le leading to when the leaseholders were firstly and hurriedly consulted. This indicates that right from the very outset, the freeholders were prepared to get this application passed with any regard to those who live in KH. It also indicates a certain degree of slyness and willingness to ride roughshod over the occupants. When they were forced to communicate with us, they suggested this would benefit the KH residents as additional dormer windows will break up the large commercial roof and make KH more domestic in nature. Let's point out that during the original um, conversion from offices to residential, the developers had the opportunity to make the building look more domestic by replacing the original windows. They chose not to do so because that would have involved expenditure for them. So any pretense of benefiting the residents is contemptible. The reality for us is that proposed planning application would cause disruption to people's lives during the construction of these further dwellings. Firstly, there is no concrete floor between the second floor and the loft space. The overloading of the building structure and additional demands on electricity supply issues into the building, water pressure, sewerage blockages, um, where will the central heating flues on the top on the top floor go? Uh, the proposed new, un new units will inevitably cause additional noise to the whole of St Matthew's Church and School during construction and afterwards. There are two babies living on the top floor. Um, this will not be something happening nearby or literally above their heads. No concrete ceiling to protect them, only plasterboards and shallow insulation. It would not take much to penetrate through the ceiling. This proposal will have significant impact on the architecture and the character of the high street. KH has been sympathetically renovated to reflect the original style and character of the building, and we love that. The original building planning permission did not intend for KH to even be for residential purposes or to be any higher than it is at present, or for the appearance of the building to be altered by having a proposed appendage on the top. There is good reasons for this. It overlooks St Matthew's Church and School, 
the higher the building, the more privacy the soil enjoys is eroded. Planners no doubt would have originally considered this when restricting the original planning consent to two existing floors. The safety implications and the logistics of this construction on the local residents, including the school children. It cannot be conceivable that this construction project will be achieved without the use of crane or some other lifting device to get materials into the lost space. There will be problems receiving, storing of materials and equipment in the vicinity of and in the car park of KH. It will also affect the residents on the premises of local businesses, safety of peace, people using the crossing in the high street, access to the school will be severely restricted for parents taking and collecting children from school. Can you imagine the disruption to people's lives if this is achieved? What impact the further rate plats would have on the value of the leasehold properties, especially those paid a higher purchase price to have a top floor apartment? While some of the occupants of KH and premises nearby work normal hours, others work from home or are shift workers. The disruption to their lives for an uncertain amount of time and with the effect on their mental health will be enormous. In fact, the only people to benefit from this scheme are greedy developers who will, will who with their initial renovation already cut costs. I would invite you to take into account their lack of care on suitable living conditions and well-being of your constituents and ask yourselves whether this scheme is in the interest of those constituents or for the financial interest of a small number of people who have no connection to the borough whatsoever. Um, thus said, this is not for the benefit of the constituents within the community as there is no affordable social housing being provided to LBH in the whole of Kirk House. As the building was repurposed, only generated income through council tax payments is the only gain LBH um, will benefit from. We would invite the planning department to carefully consider this application. This will not be for the benefit of the leaseholders, residents, religious communities or constituents in the borough. There's 24 seconds left. You can continue to hear um, Does anyone have any questions for the petitioner? No? You may take a seat. Thank you very much. You can turn the microphone off for me, please. Thank you. Uh, now I have the applicant agent. This is going to be... Forgive me before I even go down here. It's Is it Nuggy Lanos? Yeah. Lanos. Thank you for it. Nuggy is a very unusual first name. It is, yeah. Yes. Okay, fine. So... Uh, as you, as you saw earlier, you have five minutes as soon as you press the red button, and we'll go from it. Mr Chair, um, good evening. Uh, my name is Nagi Lianos. Uh, I'm here tonight representing the applicant, Drayton Kirk Limited, and also uh, Quad Architects as architects of the proposed scheme. <coughs> the scheme before you is the result of an extensive proactive engagement with the planning department, and represents a low impact, highly sustainable proposal to provide eight additional dwellings at Kirk House uh, uh, that will make uh, a useful contribution to Hillington's housing target. Um, it's low impact. The proposal is low impact in a number of ways, um, visually. Uh, essentially, this is a, a, a large loft conversion. Um, the prominent existing roof will remain and the additional of the proposed dormer windows will not have a significant impact on the uh, character or appearance of the area or the building. Um, and this is also the view of the uh, borough's design officer. It's, it's of course understandable that no one particularly welcomes construction work to a building they live in, and I understand that. Um, uh, however, during the work, the disruption is temporary, um, and we will... Um, minimise any disruption um, by our proposed method of construction which will uh, not involve taking any materials or debris uh, through the building itself, it will all be done outside through, through uh, uh, new holes in the roof as it were where we're making the dormers so there will be, uh, you know, there will be disruption und undoubtedly but it will be minimised um, and we'll obviously need as part of a uh, complying with the uh, construction management plan condition uh, to to uh, give details on on that um, the the floor construction 
will exceed the uh, requirements of the acoustic separation for both air, airborne and impact sound that are laid down by current building regs. Um, a sound test will be carried out uh, on completion to verify this point. Um, in terms of overlooking, the windows and balconies of the proposed flats are at least 21 metres away from any neighbouring flat windows, a distance generally accepted in planning terms uh, as not causing unacceptable overlooking. Uh, on St Matthew's Church side, Kirk House already has 10 flats um, that currently overlook at a much more direct level, uh, uh, first, first and second floor levels, uh, those air, uh, the, the church and the, and the school. Um, and the proposed additional two flats at third floor that would be on this side and would overlook uh, are, are set back and are much higher and so as, as has been pointed out by your planning officer um, the, the, there wouldn't be a significant increase in, in any sense of overlooking on this side of the building. Um, the six uh, proposed uh, parking spaces are in line with the uh, London plan uh, as the maximum amount allowed and these are already part of the car park and I, and I can confirm that none are allocated to existing occupants, they are available for for the, uh, the new residents of the eight proposed apar um, apartments. Um, the proposed scheme is also very sustainable, a very sustainable way of providing additional dwellings. Um, it makes use of a previously developed site in line with both local, regional and national planning policy. It's located on the high street within a short walk of West Drayton Station and Crossrail and importantly makes good use of a, a completely unused um, large loft space. Uh, so it, it, you'd be hard pressed to think of a, a you know, a, 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 a less impactful way of, uh, uh, of providing eight, eight apartments, uh, either visually or, or um, uh, practically. Uh, there are um, 15 cycle spaces proposed, but I see in the report that we should have added another two cycle spaces, but there, there's ample room for this to, to happen, and we're happy to commit to the 17 spaces that, that are required by way of condition. Um, uh, the, one, a couple of points that were, were made. One, one point um, in the report about disabled access. Um, we will be providing a new disabled compliant lift as part of the development. So although we don't have to comply with that, we, we will be complying with it. So um, that's about it really. I thank you for your time. Obviously happy to answer any, any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Um, is there anybody any questions? Yeah, Councillor Cawthorn. Councillor Mand. Thank you, yes. I have a question in relation to what we heard from the previous yeah. petitioner, which was uh, concerns being raised about the potential for noise and what I understood from what you were saying to be a wooden floor and nothing more than that. Is that a fair characterisation of the position or what, what, what would you say to that? Well, how would you respond well, to that? It's, it's, it's not a fair characterisation because obviously... Um, Sorry, could you turn the microphone on? Sorry, can you turn your uh, microphone on? Sorry. Um, no, I don't think it is a fair characterisation because I, I think the, um, uh, the building will obviously have to comply with uh, Part E of the building regulations, which is the one that deals with acoustic separation and so on. Um, there's already uh, a, a, a double-layered ceiling, which is a fire ceiling at second floor level, and we'll be going completely independently above that, so, so there won't be a connection between the two, which helps with impact impact sound um, but also it'll be in excess of because of that and because of the way we're going to construct it, it will actually be in excess of the decibel reduction uh, specified in the building regs which are uh, 45 decibels for airborne and 62 for impact sound and we'll be significantly above that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Mant. I have my questions in two parts. Um, the first part is uh, to do with um, the windows of the current building, and I heard the, the previous um, speech no, uh, making a mention about the windows not being replaced. So that's the first part. The second part is general consultation in regards to the the, the whole scheme in terms of the the current uh, residents of of the property. Have they been consulted, and um, how often? And the ones that are bought originally the top floor apartments are now not going to be top yeah. four apartments if, if this if this uh,
planning gets approved, um, could you give some insight in terms of what consultation has happened? Yeah. So two parts to that question. Thank you. Um, if I take that last point first, I, I know some of the uh, petitioners have said that uh, the, the flats were marketed as penthouse flats. I can, I can say categorically they, they never were. Um, they're not penthouse flats. And, and in fact, uh, the, 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 the sales price of the flats at that level were exactly the same as the sales price of the flats on the first floor level. Um, and they, you know, we've got a brochure there. You can look. There's no mention of any penthouse anywhere. Um, as, as I say, no one really likes to have, have um, you know, something built above them, and I understand that, but, but I don't think that's um, uh, necessarily a planning issue per se, because we're, we, we will comply with the acoustic requirements and in, in exceed them, as, I, as I've said. Um, in terms of consultation, um, obviously there was a statutory cons consultation notice that went out from the... Um, uh, from the council, and in fact, it went out twice, about a month apart. So, uh, we we also um, we wrote to every resident uh, with the drawings and and said this is what we propose to do. We also showed them, you know, the various advantages, if you like, of 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 our our, our scheme, which included a new lift, included um, uh, uh, the. Um, I've forgotten what else it included. It, it, it include, included that. Sorry, it included the fact that we we estimate the service charge for everyone will go down because there are eight additional units to then split the service charge between. I think one of them was confused and, and said the service charge would go up. That certainly wouldn't be the case. So we did everything that that we could, and and so everyone got an email. Everyone, um, you know. Uh, uh, was 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 informed of it, um, and that because there was a mistake on the initial certificate, it actually went out twice. I don't think anyone there was not aware of the application. Um, so that was that. Sorry, the, the, and the first question was in relation to the windows. Yes. Um, so no, we're not we're not looking at replacing the existing windows. The existing windows in the building are double glazed uh, 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 metal windows. Um, and yes, some, some, some residents, although uh, a minority, have said that they wanted to replace the windows, but um, uh, you know, we've said that's fine, providing you replace them on a, a visually like-for-like -like basis, um, and they wanted to improve that, but they are double glazed, they work perfectly well as far as I can see, um, and no, we've got no, no reason to replace them. Okay, Councillor Davis. Um, could you just um, explain, are you going to be scaffolding the building to gain access to the roof? Uh, yeah. If that's the case, um, can you let me know what provisions you'll be doing for the lost parking spaces during development? Uh, there, there won't be any loss of parking spaces during the development. Are you, are you covering the whole building in scaffolding? Uh, yeah, we are, but, but the, the, the verticals of the scaffolding will, will coincide with the spacing of the car park spaces, so there won't be any um, so any loss of car parking spaces during the build. So the residents that are there at the moment will currently have access to all yeah, parking at, at spaces all times, at all yeah. times. At all times. Okay. And in fact, the you can see where that white car's parked near the uh, fire escape stair. Yeah. Um, that that's a space that's actually owned by us, and and that that'll be where most things get access up the scaffold and in through the end of the roof. Some, some uh, in my terms of materials. So my concern would come, you can see the blue arches, um, I'm assuming yes. that at some point you're going to have to raise scaffold there to get to put the balconies on, or am I wrong? Uh, no, we won't need to, no, there won't be a scaffold there. There wouldn't be no scaffold there? No. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Jim. Yes, thank you. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, the petitioner mentioned about water pressure. Um, obviously you're going to make sure there's enough water pressure for the new developments upside, yeah? So that, that's going to be covered, yeah? Uh, yes, and, and, and the, uh, there's, a, there's a tank room, so we're not reliant on the general water pressure in the area. It goes into a tank room and then is pumped up uh, yeah. the building, and we have capacity to, to increase that to take care of the eight Addition. additional flats. Yeah. Okay, fine. And the last thing is, I noticed on the, the drawing there, the trees are in buckets, I'm led to believe that they were not meant to be in buckets. Is it something that you've 
sorry no, and on were... the previous because uh, i you know obviously that's an area usually it's an area which is very important for pollution and i i like to see greenery on there in that photograph hayden can you go back a couple of photos i'll tell you which one Nick, the one that's similar to there that one there that's looking very sorry for itself and it's not actually it's not actually in a it's not in the ground it's in the bucket which is not acceptable and i'm sure that wasn't in the original planning application i do appreciate this is an office space and it's been converted into flats so i understand yeah. that but things like that we you know can you um, i'm, I'm going to get officers to look at it i'm just warning you about it um because i don't think sure. that's correct okay yeah. um because it's that area needs as much help as it can with as many greenery plants or plants that will uh, yeah. do that so that's all I wanted to. Can I can I respond yes, to that? Yes, of course. You can. Um, so the uh, conversion of the um, uh, offices to flats was done under prior approval. Yes, and the prior that. approval didn't have any conditions relating to landscaping. So all the new landscaping was something that we put in that we weren't required to put in. We could okay. have not put in any. So yes, uh, the reason they're in planters rather than, they're not in buckets, they're in planters. Uh, the reason they're in planters rather than in, uh, in the ground is because of underground services and also because of uh, um, you know, uh, the, the proximity of the, the car parking spaces. So that was, that was the only reason. But we, we had no obligation to put any of the uh, okay. uh, landscaping in. Well, if you can rectify that, I, yeah. think, I think residents will appreciate that. But um, uh, I'm sure we can. Okay. Yeah. Um, I might condition it anyway, but we'll okay. see what we can go away with. Um, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. you. May I take a seat? Okay. Count, Councillor Punjab, would you like to take a seat? There is a condition. Can we, can we thicken that out a bit? Yeah, you're a councillor. So guess what? You lost. You've lost. You've lost two minutes. So you've only got three, um, and uh, off you go. Whenever as soon as you press that red button, we're going to time you. Thank you, Chair, for giving me the opportunity to represent residents of Kirk House. As you can see, that there are a few, many of them here today, and they were in uproar as the agent spoke just now, um, simply because some of the facts are incorrect. Um, firstly, I'd like to make sure that people are aware that it was by accident that residents of Kirk House found the planning application, and therefore it was pre they were notified by predating an, predating an email. This wasn't a proper consultation. This was actually just accepted as this was the way to go, and it's not acceptable that residents find out underhandedly about what, um, what planning applications are going through if they are leaseholders or residents of a particular building. Many moved in three years ago with no indication that the landowner and the freeholders had a further development of Kirk House. Um, and had they have known, residents may not have wished to have purchased these flats that they have now. It does beg the question of why wasn't this part of the original plans? Was there a quota around social housing or anything else that there wasn't part of? And does the quota still apply on buildings that have already been developed when additional dwellings are added? Because it is actually putting these dwellings now to near over 40 units in this building. This brings me to the point at which, in the report which classes Kirk House as a brownfield site. Whilst Kirk House was previously a brownfield site, it is no longer so. It has been repurposed for residential dwellings and therefore how can it be the best use of a site, of a brownfield site, because it was already in best use? The second floor residence of Kirk House will now have eight flats above them. The noise that this will bring on their day-to-day -day living post-construction has not been factored in. Um, I appreciate that they're saying that they, um, there is going to be adequate spacing above it, but I have been there and I have looked at, through the utility room, of what that space is. If you're going any further above it, it is minimal. I appreciate that legally it meets, meets all the plans, but if you were living in that space, this would not be something that you'd be happy about. The report says it will create a more residential look. We've already heard about the fact that the developers pre previously chose not to change these windows uh, to make them more residential, which, by the way, are now unlawful because they are side opening. They're full of condensation and they are not properly double glazed. They're just two panes of glass. Neighbouring schools like St Matthew's Church, we say that there's, they've got the second floor windows on the other side, but there are trees as a barrier. So as you go higher, those trees stop becoming a barrier. 
When reading the report, it came across as the extension was on a private residential building. It has already occupied commercially residential. It is already an occupied commercially residential building, of which leaseholders were only notified by accident, as I have mentioned before. There really has been no consultation with the leaseholders, and whilst I appreciate the developers want to make maximum use of the building so that they can gain the most money out of their building, it really has to be in consultation with residents because they are the ones who are going to pay the price for this. So I would urge you to consider their petition. Thank you, Councillor John. Any questions? Councillor Gravel. Thank you. Um, in the report on page 57, I'll just read out exactly what it says. Um, so this is to do with consultation, so this information we've been provided on this report, it says um, a site notice was placed at the site on the 23rd of March 2023 and all residents of the building were consulted on the 26th of April 2023. The applicant has also stated that they served notice on all residents of the building on the 31st of March and the 26th of April, giving them 21 days to respond. Residents were consulted again on the 2nd of August 2023 following the receipt of amended plans. So that, that according to this re report, we've been told that the consultation has happened three times. Can you, ca sorry, can I ask Councillor Punjo a question? Yes. Can, you, can you clarify what, what, can you clarify your side of things because, sure. because it, there's notified, conflicting information? Yeah, I was notified by residents um, that they found out by accident about this planning application. Um, that had gone through. As, um, and then the landowners um, had, the freeholders had then sent an email um, with, the, with their notice of that they were planning to do, to do this. Yes, the council did put up notice on the building, but it is up to the leaseholders, um, the, the freeholders of that property, to let the residents, if you were buying a flat in a property, I'd like my free, freeholders to be able to tell me, I am planning to do this and a planning application will be going forward, rather than coming back afterwards in, a, in what seems like an underhand fashion to say, oh, we've got our hands burnt here, we've got caught, let's go and do this now because we need to meet the rules. Um, onerously on a freeholder, I think their leaseholders that have already paid the money for their flat have to be looked after first. So if you are going to you know, um, talk about consultation, consult with them. Properly consult with them. Give them time, give them, get feedback I know that, but yes, you're working with the planning department, but you also need to work with the residents. Okay, thank you. Can oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, thank you, Chairman, um, and thank you for your answer to that question. My, my second question was, um, and a lot of what you said, I, I understand, comes directly from the residents, but as members of this committee, when we're making a decision on this particular application, we're making it based on policy points and a lot of what you've said aren't material considerations for policy that we'll be looking at. Is there, I'm just asking you if, there, if there's anything policy-based that you might like to add at this opportunity that we would take into account as a committee? I have read the report and, and you know, legally this all meets planning applications and I get that. However, we can where is this in the plan where we are supposed to look at the benefits for residents? If we're looking at our um, initial, what's the best use of building at initial stages, which is part of Hillington's planning policies, if it's looking at how we're landscaping places, we need to look at that. If we're looking at what's a community benefit to people, we have to then work beyond what is planning policy as in is in planning um, sunlight, daylight, and all of this, and impact on residents as well. And impact on residents is really, really important. This is a, people are living there at the moment. People are living there who work for our hospitals, who work on shift work, and they are going to have this noise. And it's not good enough to say that we're approving Sorry, this Pinchot, mitigation. Sorry, I asked specifically about if you have That's any not. policy yeah. points if, that okay. you'd like us to consider. Yeah, Councillor Cawthorn. Um, yeah, that's not dissimilar to, uh, to my colleague's question in relation to consultation. So, uh, just want to be clear what you're advocating. Are you advocating that the applicant should uh, withdraw the application and re run the consultation? Or are you saying that they, they should engage with residents moving forward? Should they get consent this evening? Um, I okay. would urge the, well, the residents have asked for this not to be approved, so therefore I am supporting the residents in this not to be approved. Okay. People do not want further rate flats above them. Um, and I do appreciate that this has to go through planning policy, okay. Okay. but every planning policy seems to be working in, not in favour of the residents that live in these communities. 
Okay, I can shed some light on that in a minute. Thank you very much. Do you want to take it? Well, I'll do it. I don't know. There you go. Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, while you can see me frantically talking to officers, while I was listening, I have ability to do that and that. It's very rare for a man, but I can do it. Um, I've asked officers to go in and double check about consultation. I can confirm that on the council's behalf, I can't confirm on the applicant, but I can count on our, our behalf that we were definitely sent out on the 20. Or the fourth, 23, a letter to all of the people in the building. So I can say that on, how, on, our, on our side because that's what I can do. I can check it while we're going through. So that bit, whether the applicant has done that, I have no idea. And, and that, that, but, but as I said, that, that's not that's not my concern. That's this, this is my concern as the committee, as a planning department. Are we working in the correct way? And we've done what our due diligence. Right. So what I'm going to do is there was a couple of issues, but I'm going to open it to the floor and I can pick them up at the end. Councillor Gohill and Councillor Davis. Councillor Thanks, Smith. Chairman. Um, two quick questions, if that's okay. Um, the first one is a small point, but I just want to check it's covered. Um, on page 59, um, it said, uh, it said I'd recommend a condition to provide a sample of the grey aluminium panel proposed for the dormer roof extensions. I just wanted to make sure that's covered under. I, there was an approval. There was an approval condition for materials, but it doesn't specifically state that. Is that something that can be added if if it's going in that direction? Please. Thank you. And the second. Sorry. Yes, it can be. Uh, thank, thank you. And the second point was just a concern about access. Um, given that it's on, on the main road, um, if they're going to have lots of big construction vehicles coming in and out, um, I just want to ask if a transport officer, if possible, um, if there's been proper reports done into how that might impact the busy high street. Um, I think that's covered on our building control plan, but I'll just ask officers to answer that. Is that right, Hayden? Uh, yeah, that is right, and also there is the condition on the application for the construction management plan, so that allows us to have a, a I guess, a, a development which would go forward in the least disruptive way in terms of highways impacts as well as impacts on residents. Okay. Okay, Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, can I just, if I may, can I just ask legal, are you happy with a consultation that has taken place? Yes, I am. Yes, we've, we've covered it. We have looked at the reports and discussed it within our internal team as well. And I agree. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. I also have another couple of questions, if Please, I may. Please, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so I notice on 7.8, the impact on neighbours, that, mo that focuses more on the residents around the area rather than the residents in the building. Um, and I can see that in the construction management plan, there is nothing to condition the working times. Considering that the location... If we were to move forward with this application, can we can can we add physically to the construction management plan the total working hours? From what I can see, it's not in there. We can, Councillor Davis. We can. We can. That is covered, but you want it a bit more specific. I, I physically yeah. want to see that. Um, um, what page is that on? Uh, I've lost it. <laughs> we'll come back to it, don't worry. Um, and a lot of my questions are going to be on the construction management plan. Sorry, Chairman. That's fine. Um, also, we've never done it, but I'm very concerned about the scaffolding if we were to move forward um, with this plan. That the scaffolding, I would like to see, I don't know if it's possible, <laughs> a scaffolding yeah. plan. Because I, I'm, at the moment, there is no condition to say we've, ha we've had. We've had a gentleman's agreement sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Talk, carry, carry. Um, we've had a gentleman's agreement or a, a, a word said here, but I'm not sure. So if we can have something like that added... I will ask. There's no harm in asking. Yeah. Well, we'll think. Counter, uh, sorry, Councillor. Hey, Hayden, please go ahead. I'm more than happy to have that specific requirement added to the condition. I think it's also worth noting that looking at the condition... It also says that the hours during which development works will occur shall be agreed by condition. So that covers your first point about 
works may be being carrying out under um, during un antisocial or unsocial hours that can all be covered by condition. Um, if I may, I understand it can be. I physically want today to no, come with a time. No, no, it, we, that's we. Okay, well, I, well, the best I can do is I can ask officers to bring it back to me as the yep. chairman. Yeah. And my final point, if I may, yep. is about loading and unloading of vehicles. Can we have a time on that? Because that's not in there. If we were to move forward, that would that would operate in the building control area. Yes. Yeah? Still would. I still would like that and rigid vehicles only. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Thank you, you Chairman. Keep, pick that up. Uh, yeah, that is definitely something we can add, but like I said, everything is covered in the construction management plan condition, which is condition four, and uh, specifically the hours of use and, sorry, hours of work are in condition four, part C. Okay, thank you. Traffic management is always in there, is also in there. Brilliant. Sorry, thank you. That's all right. Okay, is that you finished? You sure? Okay, fine. Uh, Councillor Singh. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, my question is about noise, like the top floor is no concrete. So how we can measure the noise before and after? Could you give more details for that? But the, um, I think, let me just check. I mean, obviously the uh, applicant did inform us that there is already a fire, uh, f uh, f fly, fire, um, what's it called? Yeah. Ceiling, there you go. I was going to say thingy with Bob. Uh, there's a fire ceiling. <laughs> and then on top of that, they're building another area on top. I just cannot, can I have officers confirm that that's correct? Yeah, that is correct. And to add to those points, and as confirmed by the applicant a minute ago, there are building control regulations which would noise insulate the buildings <coughs> to an appropriate standard to ensure that there isn't any adverse noise impact. So noise would be addressed by building control as well as planning. In, you want anything else? No? Okay. Uh, Councillor Cawthorn. Yeah, uh, three quick ones, if I may. Um, I'm always, always uneasy when I look at planning applications where there are, there's a policy conflict around amenity space, including that, uh, that, that what I'm picking up from the report is that that is, that is, that is the case. However, I'll see where the discussion takes us this evening. Three quick questions. I think we heard from the case officer earlier on uh, about overlooking, an existing overlooking uh, from Chilton House. Uh, I, think he, I think he went on to say, well, th th there's existing overlooking and there will be, it, it will not be any worse than the current situation, but surely there's an additional tier of uh, windows surely coming about as a result of this. And so I'm not quite sure how he can say that, unless I completely misunderstood his point. You, you've, you've got the point, but slightly, slightly thinking. Those windows are actually set back further in the roof line. So they're not. So you've got windows here, and then the, those are going to be back there. So it's going to be a harder angle to see. But I'll ask yeah, officers. One here with the case officer, please. Thank yeah. you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Higgins. Firstly, I think that is correct, and I think what I was trying to say in terms of loss of privacy and uh, overlooking to neighbouring properties is that the existing residents at first floor and at second floor already look toward all neighbouring sites. So yes, we would be adding additional residents, but those views would be similar views to those which are already at the development site. And for that reason, there would be so no significant increase in overlooking or no significant increase in um, a loss of privacy. And as mentioned by Councillor Higgins, these windows are set further back than those, so they would be further away from those neighbouring houses. Hmm. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, th there was a couple of other things. Go on, made. go ahead. Uh, in relation to, um, I've dealt the noise one, so I'll leave that. There's, there's one final point about uh, refuse arrangements I want to ask about because uh, I, I never, I'm never quite sure whether the waste team are cons consultees in this. There, there's a comment, um, where are we? I think on page 68, that possibly an additional bin could be conditioned. I never quite know whether how well existing. Uh, refuse collection are working uh, and whether you know, food waste is, is operating in flats already so I, I wouldn't mind just a little bit more meat on the bone in terms of how we propose to take that bit forward please. Thank you. Um, within our landscaping condition there is a requirement for an additional bin as requested. Yeah, so, so what we've got to be careful here because Obviously, this is an existing building with existing flats, and there obviously there's an existing waste management plan already in site. So all we can ask on this application is an additional bin. Um, whether they are going to take up the uh, food waste 
section, that is something which the council and residents have to sort that out. I don't think that's a planning. We can really force that through in the planning. But okay. you know, if I'm wrong, my officers will tell me. Well, if I may, Chairman, so irrespective of how well the current situation is working, let alone with an additional tier of units on top, that, 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 that's not a material planning consideration for us to take account of this evening, then, just to be clear. It is only on those uh, eight dwellings that are in the roof. Only the dwellings in the roof are irrelevant to this planning application. The rest of the building, that was done on a previous application. Okay. Any other questions? Councillor Davis. Oh, sorry. Councillor Mann first. Sorry, Councillor Davis. Thank I you, Chair. I have written you down here, don't worry. Thank you, sir. Um, I've got a, a question uh, in regards to the housing mix uh, for the officers. I mean, I'm looking at page 59 of the report uh, where it mentions the borough wide requirement for larger affordable housing. And it also mentions that one of the units is a one bedroom, one person unit. Um, although in the report it also mentions four times one bedroom units and towards the end of that housing mix paragraph it says it is considered that the housing mix is deemed to be broadly acceptable in this instance I just wanted the planning officers to shed some light on uh, the housing mix of this development uh, thank you councillor firstly um, in terms of the housing mix there is the borough wide requirement for more family housing with this particular scheme we're not losing any family housing so there's definitely no loss but what we do have is an addition of eight additional units of different sizes different scales which will be provided for different people and their different requirements so whilst the housing mix doesn't add to family housing it does add to the borough's requirement for housing itself and we do have a policy which requires different types of housing for the changing nature and changing residents which are in the borough. So I think the mix of two beds and one beds is acceptable. Okay, Councilman. Yeah, Councillor Davis. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, I was just reminded of the applicant's uh, statement that there's no green, we're no conditions on trees and green walls. Ah, but I'm coming to that, Councillor Davis. You okay. just point me to it. I want to thresh, I want to examine this landscaping a bit more. I would, uh, I would that, have to agree as, with you. As, as the gentleman saw that I was very keen on my trees, so I'm just going to go, I'm going to have a look at that. Yeah, if we could. Yes, so can officers say, um, what can we do and what can we cannot do is uh, I think is the um can we uh, explore I, I, I think we could, but my, I think my concern is we're putting eight additional units within the roof of an existing building. We're utilising existing parking spaces. It's not leading to any loss of greenery. While we've got policies which would promote uh, more greenery, more trees within the site, I'm not too sure how reasonable it would be or how we could argue that it would be reasonable to add more planting or more greenery into the site because the conditions to put any condition on the application needs to meet the five tests and one of them is being reasonable and necessary to allow for the development to take place um, as we're not losing any as we're not changing the parking layout I'm, I'm not too sure how we could say we need additional trees or or that additional trees are necessary to make the development acceptable in planning terms if that makes sense yeah I, I understand but um, we can um, there's going to be Eight more cars, and um, so we're gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna try and part chance my arm here. We got. We got eight more cars. Uh, I appreciate that. Is there any way that we can have a living wall somewhere, or something that up on the roof, or a roof garden, or something that would encourage wildlife or things like that? And I, would we? Obviously, you're changing the use of the roof. So if we're changing the use of the roof, then we can change the use of landscaping on the roof and. Uh, help the environment a little bit more so uh, i think that's a good point and i think that's definitely something which we could take into account there is a landscaping condition on the application which means that the developer would have to send all landscaping details to us prior to carrying out any work at the site and we could make sure that there were some additional planting on that which we would agree in writing prior to it being done that's brilliant so i told you a chance me on anything else anybody else councillor mand Thank you, Chair. Um, I still would like some clarity on the windows, um, the, the current windows and the ones that are proposed for the new development in terms of are they fit for purpose, because we did see the residents mention 
the, the windows um, not being fit for purpose, but the applicant said they are fit for purpose. So I just wanted what the, what, what the I'll, planning I'll, team's yeah. views is on that. Yeah, Councillor, I'll take that. Well, obviously, the existing, the new windows that were going to come, come in, we can talk about, and I'll make sure that officers make sure they're double glazed. I've asked officers now to look in at previous application what the situation was on those windows, and they will come back to me, and uh, I will uh, make a judgment. I'll, I'll let everybody know what the situation is. I think that's that's fair because obviously that's an application that was done before, which we don't have to hand. Okay. Thank you, Chair. That's helpful. Okay. Fine. Um, right. So we have a bit of a change on landscaping. So we're going to have something green that now the applicant's there. He can come up with something for us uh, and make sure those buckets or tubs or whatever are properly planted. That'd be great. Um, also. Um, your scaffolding condition, which is new, which actually I think we might ask to put that in all of them, just as if there is scaffolding uh, in place. Um, apart from that, is there anything on the no? There's nothing on the addendum. So those changes can either. I, I just had a. Um, I just had the the sample providing. I don't know if that's covered under the materials condition yeah. already, um, or if that could be specified in there. So just yeah, we check. could make that explicit in the condition yeah. that it covers that particular aspect of it. Yeah, so that would be done. That would be done as well. So those are all the uh, changes. Did you get all that, Steve? Mm -hmm. It's like we're on video. You can always come back to it. Sorry, Chairman. I'm on the scaffolding point, would mm. that be an extra clause we could add to the construction management plan yes. for the position of the scaffolding? Yes. Yeah. It's just to make sure, because I, c I get where Councillor Davis is going. If the scaffolding goes up and it, it, the parking is not, you know, if it's slightly narrower, then it's a, it's a problem. So we make sure that that's that's done and, and obviously with the applicant here we, he can see that so um, can I have someone to propose Councillor Davis uh, thank you chairman um, I understand the councillors comments I completely understand the residents as well but we as a planning committee need to follow policy and the London plan um, so I would I would go in favour of officers recommendations as I feel what we've put in place today is right for the residents and protects them the most. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Davis proposed. Councillor Gohill. Thank you, Chairman. Um, initially, this application sat weirdly with me. Um, you know, no one likes no one likes flats being built above um, above their existing uh, place of living. And um, yeah, whilst we did ask a lot of questions about how how the sort of building work would be mitigated. Um, we understand that, of, of course, during during construction there is going to be some sort of noise. But I, uh, as Councillor Davies said, um, if we went elsewhere with this, if we if we made a different decision with this um, application, there's a very real chance that the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, would overturn it because of his London plan. Um, and if he overturned it, he could overturn it just on the basis of this. What we've done here as a committee is we've tried to include different um, different conditions on the on the basis to make this more of a a bit more a bit more palatable for the residents then and whilst it's and whilst there's a lot of policy um, there's a lot of points that emotional points that the that the residents have raised um, I we have to look at this application on the basis of policy it's why I asked your local ward councillor if she had any policy points that I could consider more um, there weren't, there are emotional points and we've had to take into account policy points as a whole um, but on that basis I think we've done as much as we can to pad and protect the residents here and on that basis Chairman, um, I'll second officer's recommendation. Thank you very much so I propose and second, can I show those hands of those in favour with the application please show me those extra conditions Councillor Corfield yeah. that's fine uh, any objections or abstaining Abstain. Two. So mm -hmm. two abstain mm -hmm. and four. Thing. That application is approved with those variations on conditions. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Okay, can you, uh, sorry, we have a meeting to continue, can you? Okay, thank you. Next.
next item is uh, for Rumford Road Northward. Max, over to you. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, for Rumford Road in Northward. Uh, this is an application for demolition of existing outbuilding, demolition of part single story addition to existing house, and the construction of a new. Uh, it's a single accessible dwelling which is located in the back garden of the property. Um, we see we can have the location of the property, it's an ordinary suburban location, very you know, quite a large uh, back garden to the to the site, so there is uh, space there, but it's gone to a to a semi detached property and there's no uh, particular uh, planning designations of, of, of note on the site. Um, so there we have the outline just showing at the bottom of the screen you see the outbuilding to be demolished and um, here we can see where the new building will be located. You see the, the red is the existing pair of semis and the, and the grey in the bottom left corner is the, um, is the new house. Um, it should be single storey but it would also have another level at that basement level. Um, it would have uh, two bedrooms and the bedrooms would be at, the, at that basement level. So there are some elevations showing how is a very contemporary design proposed. Um, there we can see a cross section, and you can see the, uh, the basement level. So you see the windows, you know, sort of slip windows at the, at the top of the basement level, allowing some light um, and, you know, to the subway tone level. Um, more images from the applicant, just showing how the relationship of the buildings would work. Um, there's another one showing the existing street scene. And here we are, you can see the scale of the building in relation to the back garden. And this is a street scene view, another street scene view, and a third. Now, um, officers are recommending refusal of this scheme for a number of reasons. Here's some more images, and that's, that's, here's a sort of aerial image from you know, looking from the northeast across the site. And you can see the trees along the bottom boundary of the site. Um, there's, there's an in-principle objection to this scheme. It's incongruous and unusually dominant. Um, so we have a policy about um, development in backland and garden locations, to which on the previous item we noted that in exceptional cases, the you know, development could, could proceed in backland and back garden locations. And this is certainly not a, an exceptional location for a, for a new dwelling. Um, there's also concerns about the impact on, of the new dwelling on on the uh, on the existing building uh, for Rothant Road, um, you know, the proximity and how overbearing it would be in the relation. And we can see like the plans and see the relationship how you know, the house would extend along, you know, parallel to the, the boundary of the of the retained rear garden of the of the retained house. And um, there'd be insufficient private private amenity space for both uh, properties. And there's a substantial um, rear garden at the moment. Given the way it's laid out and the, the lack of efficiency of the layout, that would result in you know, insufficient not complying with our standards. And there's also poor standard of accommodation in the proposed uh, unit because of the um, absence of sufficient daylight to the ground, to the basement level, and also inadequate floor to ceiling heights. We see we look for 2.5 meters, and um, you know, there are, you know, the floor to ceiling heights are much much lower than that in this proposal. Um, so sort of concerns about the um, the uh, how the, the site could be subject to, um, to, to crime wouldn't deter crime just because of its relationship with the street and also there's a lack of uh, basement impact assessment and of course that raises concern about um, the risk of uh, surface water flooding and, um, uh, and other impacts from basic, uh, basement development. Um, that's one final refusal reason is the impact on trees. You can see from this, this band there's, there's quite a lot of trees in the vicinity of the site uh, all protected by TPOs. Um, the application proposes to uh, to do some work to some trees which are outside the site. They're actually in the council's ownership to three trees and do a crown lift, not not felling them, but they do they do provide an, an important contribution to the the character of the area. So you see the front of the site. You see the see the side road there, where the house would, new house would front onto. Um, just going through some build some images of the existing housing. You can see there it's got in it. You can really see the. The, uh, you know, the tree, you know, the you know, really sort of verdant context, and um, the trees would be affected well towards the back of the site. And there, in this image, you can see the existing outbuilding that would be demolished. So um, we're all, um, we've got to see the trees at the back of the site, some of them which would be affected by, by crown raising works. And that's that's a view from further on along the lane. So overall, we're recommending refusal of the reason set out. A previous application was 
was refused at this site for a new dwelling in a different location within the site. Uh, that was appealed, and the appeal was dis dismissed by the uh, planning inspectorate. And um, I, I, I would anticipate that an, an appeal on this application would go a similar way. Thank you, Max. That's good to know that we won that one. Um, David Burns, would you like to come forward? And thank you for quieting them down outside. That's very kind of you. I think you've seen, press the button, five minutes, Amber, you've got buzzers now, it's scaring me, but there we go. Thank you, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak at the committee meeting, Mr Chairman. Uh, a year today since the, I last voiced local opposition to an application for a separate dwelling in the back garden of this address. So I speak tonight on behalf of the signatories to the petition from the residents of both Rofant Road and Ashbourne Square, who are opposed to this planning application. We agree with the planning officer's recommendation to refuse consent. Uh, just note, I also serve as the chairman of the Ashbourne Square Residents Association, which represents our property interest in the shared amenity opposite the proposed site, as well as in all matters relating to our shared use of facilities and our experience of life in the square. I'd like to thank the planning officer for their detailed response to this application and note that the resulting recommendations concur with the principal objections we raised in our petition. The application is basically contrary to council policy, as it is clearly a back garden, not even a back land development, of a scale, design, materials, which is at odds with the surrounding area. The proposed dwelling would detract from the existing amenity of the area, extend beyond the line of the existing houses, and it would interfere with valuable mature trees from a 1970 TPO, crammed as it is, in fact, even closer to those trees than the last proposal. Uh, and I think some of the applicants' um, illustrations had uh, a degree of artistic license with the size of those TPO trees, which really do overhang the site considerably. Uh, the strength of feeling surrounding this application and its predecessor application remains centred on its requirement to facil facilitate not only those um, uh, points that I've made, but also access to a new frontage road on our access road to the properties in Ashbourne Square. The impact on trees which screen our properties from the noise of the Metropolitan Line and provide visual amenity if you've seen for a quiet tree-lined access road. Once again, the proposal would fundamentally alter the area, the purpose of our dedicated access road, and introduce a building of an entirely different character to our area, which is predominantly townhouses. While the residents of Ashbourne Square agree complete with the recommendation for refusal of planning permission, we'd like to continue to question whether the proposed provision of a drop curb accessed onto Ashbourne Square is adequately addressed. Uh, the impact on our vital ro access road would be wholly unacceptable, not simply for the very obvious destruction of its visual, visual amenity. The access road is in fact barely wide enough for two cars to pass as it is. It's slightly under the minimum 4.8 metre width. Vehicles do not routinely park in this access road be precisely because they can see it's obviously a narrow access road and provides no access on either side, only to Ashbourne Square. It's inconceivable that providing a property frontage with a drop curb access on our access road will do anything other than encourage parking, delivery vehicles and visitors, and block access for council refuse vehicles, recycling vehicles, the emergency services delivery vehicles, and residents. We do not want you to have to deal with navigating around parked cars or, as pedestrians, have to dodge large vehicles which already mount the pavement on occasion to avoid parked vehicles in the road. Um, also, um, as is highlighted, in fact, by the addendum, um, the way the vegetation is so close to the proposed access, uh, the vegetation would restrict access to visibility of vehicles emerging, and any parked vehicles in the road would restrict our visibility of them emerging from the property Plus, in order to park, as shown in the applicant's proposal, you have to execute a pretty nifty U-turn on an extremely narrow road. Another aspect of the revised application which causes us considerable concern is the subterranean nature of the property. The portion of our access road closest to the Transport for London embankment and public right-of-way already suffers as a result of clay slippage down the embankment. Basically, the road surface is cracked because of the nature of the embankment. Um, and it was only repaired a few years ago. Any excavation such as proposed in this application so close to both the embankment and our access road is likely to aggravate damage to the road surface. So this application seeks to develop a residential back garden, again, on our dedicated access road by increasing the density of housing unrealistically, by destroying the immunity of trees in our neighbourhood. We oppose this application, we oppose its predecessor, and we will oppose all similar applications. Thank you very much.
Mr. Burns. Has anybody else got any questions for Mr. Burns? No? Thank you. If you can turn the microphone off and take a seat, that'd be fantastic. Um, we have an, a written response, Steve, yeah. for the applicant and agent. Okay, so we have a response here submitted by the agent on behalf of the applicant. Please note, we have not been instructed to represent our client in person. However, they have prepared the below statement as they will be out of the country on the day of the meeting. It has been two years wasted in Hillenden planning land. My father was 100 when we came to you with the pre-application. The pre-app was very favourable. Please listen to it if a record was kept of the conversation. We listened to your concerns after the first application. This second application ticked all the boxes with most but a few of the same neighbours who live at least 50 yards away. The National Planning Guidelines say uh, that the National Pol Planning Policy Framework 2012, updated 2018, 19 and 21, paragraph 8 notes that sustainable development has three components, social, economic and environmental. Paragraph 11 clarifies the theme thus. At the heart of the National Planning Policy Framework is a presumption in favour of sustainable development, which should be seen as a golden thread running through both planning, plan making and decision taking. For decision taking, this means approving development proposal, uh, proposals that accord with the development plan without delay, and where the development plan is absent, silent or relevant policies are out of date, granting permission unless any adverse impacts of doing so would significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits when assessed against the policies in this framework taken as a whole or specific policies in this framework. With regard to decision taking, the NPPF states that local planning authorities should approach decision taking in a positive way to foster the delivery of sustainable development. The relationship between decision taking and plan making should be seamless, translating plans into high quality development on the ground. Local planning authorities should look for solutions rather than problems and decision takers at every level should seek to approve applications for sustainable development where possible. The London Plan 2021 sets out the regional planning policies, although not cited in the decision notice or relevant to this. If you really want to uh, fare my 102-year-old dad, do a site visit and you will see. The only people this, this new house for our two dads would affect is us at number four, Rothamp Road. There's a railway line at the back. There is a road to one side with our house on the other side. We have a large plot of land which is crying out to be built on. Please at least do a site visit before making a decision. Best wishes to all the councillors from the Vora family who are out of the country. Thank you, Steve. Um, okay, so we don't... Well, that would be me talking if I had to talk. I don't. So I go straight to committee. Um, Councillor Gort, Go Hill, Councillor Cawthorn. Just a quick one for me. Um, one of the refusal reasons um, is the sill was refusing con refusing consent to the sill. Is that the applicant that was refusing con consent? And do you have any more information about why they refused, so to say? Um. Sorry, can I just confirm which number? Uh, number two. Oh, sorry, it's an informative. It's on page 78. Um. Oh, that's just a, a standard informative that we'd put when we're refusing a still um, liable application. It would just make sure that the still levy gets picked up if we go to appeal and uh, where the inspectorate to grant it, we would still get the still levy. Oh, so yourselves that are yeah so just we, to we put it on there just in case if the applicant goes to appeal and we lose which i doubt very much on this one but anyway uh then then the seal kicks in and, and we get money for that oh, okay yeah? thank you for clarifying that's fine councillor Cawthorn. thank you um i support the recommendation and don't want to uh, prolong it uh, other than just to make a comment about what was said by the applicant in their submission about the pre-app uh, allegedly being favourable towards this proposal. Uh, not the first time I've heard it, and it worries me just a little bit, because whilst no, pre-apps are not binding on the local authority, they are a material planning consideration. So I hope there's no basis for that, and if there's a need to look at that more generally, that we will do. I appreciate that may be a conversation that goes outside this committee. I'll just make that comment, and with that, I will move the Definitely. recommendations. Thank, Thank you. you very much. So I'm proposed. Now, I, Councillor David. 
Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, looking at the report, the standard of living doesn't seem up to scratch. The size, the bulk, the height and the depth, um, the loss of um, TPO trees, the concern with the width of the road as well. And personally, I have some some concerns on the the effects on the surrounding area with with the depth of the property. Um, I would second officer's recommendation. Thank you. So I'm proposed and seconded. Can I have a show of hands those in favour with officer's recommendation for refusal? That's unanimous. Yep. The first one of the evening. Thank you very much. And keep the good work up. Thank you. Right, so we go on to the next item, which is item 9, uh, 22 Fringewood Close. I'm just going to, before we start that, I'm just going to get legal to come in here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, we, we do a short, short presentation. Yeah, 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 History a bit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes, please. Please. Sorry, it's very hot, and I will let people get water and whatever they need.
Yeah, uh, I'd like to bring the QC to order, please. Um, okay, so the next item is item 9, 22 Fringewood Close. Max. Okay, the proposal here for erection of a single story annex for unsightly residential use, use with the glazed link between annex and existing house. Uh, members attended a, um, a site visit on this one. Um, obviously, it was re reported the previous. Uh, planning committee and it was deferred for that to uh, to take place. We note that the case officer has also attended a site visit again in relation to this site. Um, officer's recommendation is um, the same as on the previous scheme, uh, the previous scheme, the, the, the previous um, report to committee, and it is for you know just you know, refusal because of the basis of the um, you know, a backland house, its impact on neighbouring property, um, and the potential living conditions of the of the future of the fu future building and its effect on the existing house um, we um, also just like to note um, you know, we were aware of obviously aware of the personal circumstances of the of the occupier of the existing house in particular regard to uh, age and, and, and disability and this has been considered in in consider in regard to the application but um, you know, I don't believe that a, that, that a building of this scale is necessary to, to, to address concerns around that, and, and there's, there's plenty that could be done to the house in terms of adaptations that would, um, that would, that would enable it to be, be, be more livable. Um, so, yeah, obviously we would continue to work with the, the applicant um, to, to achieve that, but obviously this application, which you know, is, is, is by fact and degree a, a separate house and a, a new dwelling in the, in the gardening of the, of the property, in a very similar way to the uh, to the previous item, um, so officer's recommendation remains to refuse. Okay, okay you can see um, uh, the site. We have got a detached dwelling, um, it's a very substantial garden in the corner of a of the cul-de-sac. Um, there it is. You know, you can see the overall plan there. We can see a plan showing the sight line, showing the the, the location of the new building in relation to the existing house, and uh, you know, here it is again. You see the glazed link between those two properties, and that's the, uh, the roof plan as well. Um, see the uh, the annex has everything that's required for independent living. So it's got a single bedroom, but a very substantial kitchen, dining, and living room space, and the bathroom. So yeah, it, it, it is a to all intents and purposes, a separate dwelling with a, with a you know, separately accessible, and it would be capable of independent living from the existing dwelling. Another roof plan, and we can see the relationship of the building as proposed compared to the previous application that was refused. You can see the purple outline. So it has reduced in scale since the previous scheme, but it, but it, it, in in most respects, it's the same uh, as, as as previously, just reduced in scale. It's still a, a single. Uh, bed detached dwelling, and there's some more images of uh, seeing the purple line in relationship to existing and the, the, the previously considered and what is now proposed. Um, there's, there are, there's the um, there's a tree plan, obviously a very verdant site. I think it'll be removal of some trees immediately on the boundary uh, aerial view, and we can see the existing street scene, you know, suburban street scene. You'd be a, you would have the dwelling would be tucked into the into the corner there between those two houses. So yeah, as, as set out in the report, we we're recommending refusal. Thank you, Max. That's a good refresher for what we had before. Okay, so uh, there's no petition, there's nothing on this. It goes straight to the floor. Who wants to take away first? Councillor Gohill. Just a question. Um, I I was there. I was the only council present on the site visit. Um, I asked Katie to take some pictures on the day. I was just wondering if they're included because they provided some key, some important context I think the committee would like to see. Just scroll through to them, it's got a picture from the original site visit, um, so here's sort of the back garden, you can see the new annex would be to the to the right, and on the left there is the existing detached dwelling, and there's another one of the house, here's another one showing the, here's the wider context of the garden, you can see the extent of the garden, and there we are again, this is looking towards the corner of the garden. Sorry, if you could just clarify, because again, it isn't obvious from the photo. So, the hedge on the right hand. Oops, sorry, if you go back, the hedge on the right hand side would have to be. There is land behind that, which is part of their property as well. And it's, I think, part of the proposal. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is it's being cut back to build, to build it, to build that space. So, 
um, just in terms of where it would exactly be, because I found it quite confusing looking at the floor plans. Okay, let's see if the additional photos can shed light on that. Ah, so there we are. So that's the opposite side of the hedge. That's not that's not a boundary hedge. So that's that's part of where the where the building would be. So yeah, that that is a, that is helpful image. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And it's right. So we've seen photos. Can uh, Councillor Davis? Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, I was I was really. In keen for the site visit. I'm so sorry I wasn't there for technical problems with my car. Um, I've, I've spent some real time reviewing this and I understand there's some real personal reasons behind this but I, I have to go with officers' recommendations on this. I've looked at it myself, I've reviewed the plans, we've had a good few weeks to go over this since the last time we've met and I think there are some changes that you guys could do with speaking with the planning team um, and I think that's the way I would go. So with that in mind, I'm going to recommend that we go with officer's recommendation for refusal. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Can I have a seconder or Councillor Cawthorn? Uh, I wouldn't get a second because I'm not sure that I can, having not taken part in the first discussion on the site visit. But, however, uh, I mean, I do support the recommendations uh, for what it's worth. And I think uh, it's worth remembering that, that if I've read this map correctly, it's it fringes Copswood. Uh, triple SI, so that's another consideration that I suppose we should take account of in this. So I'll, do, I'll support the recommendation. If it's in order for me to second, then I will do. You can, Fine. legally, or, but obviously it's up to it's a council guy who wants to do it as she went on the site visit. It's up to her. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, initially, this was this is one that I really felt strong again with Councillor Davis we both felt really strongly that we wanted to go and see the site having seen the site there was some of the in my opinion in my personal opinion some of the refusal recommendations didn't stand as strongly but the ones that did were the bulk and the size and also the precedent that we might set and and you know I, I really truly understand everything that's happened happening and the reasons why and um, having seen the space myself, I truly understand the, the reason why things were put in a particular way, but the precedent that's set to it is, is one that was set throughout the borough, um, and it could, really, it could really be quite a dangerous precedent that's set for people um, creating freestanding dwellings in their back garden. As, you, as you, you've been here seeing, we just rejected a previous application, which was something almost entirely similar on, on a similar basis as well. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go with officers' recommendations on this one, but I would say that we were taking this application into account as a whole. So we're taking everything into account, and I would urge, I would urge the applicants who are, you know, in the room, it might won't be on YouTube, but in the room to really listen to what officers have to say, and if there are changes they are recommending, to really listen and implement those, and there could be a different outcome um, if you know, the officer's recommendations are adhered to. But the basis of what we've seen in front, I'm going to have to go with officer's recommendations. So, Chair, if I could second that, please. Thank you very much. So, let's propose and second. I, I echo that. I mean, we did ask, I remember the first time it came, which is the time before the time before. And I know that officers did approach you and tried to help you with the application. I, as I said, you know, we're not, we're not unsympathetic to the situation, but as you can see from the previous application, it really is the same thing, but just in a different location. Maybe a better design, maybe slightly thing, but it's still the same thing. It's, it's a back thing, uh, and, you, and you're more than entitled to have an extension on your property. That's that, that's not. I don't think that's up for debate. But obviously, with the relevant planning application. But on that note, it's proposed and seconded. Can I have a show of hands? Those in favour of the officer's recommendation. That's unanimous. Thank you. That's. That's with also reckon, so that's up for it. Let's refuse. Item 10 is Pembroke House Rice Dip. I believe Councillor Cawthorn, you will leave the room. Oh, actually, do you know what? Do you, do you officers, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to fly this a bit. Why don't you sit down, Councillor Cawthorn? Can we do item 11 first? Is that okay, Nisha? Sorry, my, my and then then Council Cawthorn can go straight home if he wishes. Then so I beg your pardon to make you.
to go. I think I think that's just a, a little bit better way of doing things. Sorry for the audience if you're anticipating that item, but uh, it, it's only it's only, it will only be a few minutes of it. So can we do item 11 first, please? Thank you, Chair. Item 11, number 12, Marsworth Close, Hayes. The application proposes the erection of a single story side rear extension. This is a part retrospective application as some works have already been undertaken but have since stopped pending the decision of this planning application. This is the location and block plan. Um, this is the aerial view. The application property comprises a two-storey end-of-terrace house within an, with an attached garage. Um, this is the constraints plan. The site doesn't fall within any heritage asset designations and is not covered by a tree preservation order. Um, this is the existing ground floor plan or the pre-existing um, because they've already started some works. Um, the pre-existing floor plans, pre-existing elevations, this is the proposed ground floor plan, so I'm just going to point out the footprint of the extension. So it's this element here, um, it's single storey. Um, it's going to serve as a utility room, a bathroom and a conservatory area. Um, these are some proposed floor plans. Again, there's no changes being made at first floor level or within the roof space. These are the proposed elevations. Um, so uh, this is the rear elevation, this is the conservatory element here, and then you have the single storey side element here. So this is the rear elevation of the application property, facing towards the adjoining neighbour at number 13, um, facing towards the rear again, um, and then this is the boundary with the neighbours at uh, number 10, I believe. Um, this is taken from the first floor window within the application property facing into the rear garden. This is number, num this is number 9 here. Um, another, win another photo taken from the first floor window, um, it's facing towards the mutual boundary of number 13. Um, and this is the proposed block plan. In terms of consultations, three letters of objection have been received and their comments primarily relate to loss of light, loss of privacy, overbearing impact and the concern that the property would be converted into a HMO. A ward councillor has objected to the application, raising concerns that the development being unneighbourly and detrimental to the ability of neighbouring occupiers to enjoy their garden amenity space. It should be clarified that this application is not seeking the change of use of the property into a HMO. For the reasons discussed in Section 5 of the Committee Report, officers are satisfied that the proposed single storey side slash rear extension will not cause undue harm to the residential amenities of neighbouring occupiers at numbers 9, 10, 11 and 13. Um, in terms of light, outlook, sense of occlusion, privacy, I'm more than happy to go over that in a bit more detail at the end of the presentation if councillors want to ask me some questions. Um, and then I just wanted to make a po point about this area here. So as part of this application, um, there's a raised platform, um, approximately 100 millimetres. Um, if I just go to the plan, so it's this element here that's been raised um, just to emphasize that you can build raised platforms up to 30 centimeters under permitted development rights um, that raised platform is not considered to give rise to any significant privacy or overlooking issues for the neighboring occupiers um, and I'll just show you the relationship with the neighboring occupier so that raised platform element is running along this boundary here um, and uh, we're satisfied that it wouldn't give rise to unreasonable loss of privacy for the occupiers at number 10. Okay, um, thank you.
Oh, sorry. Um, this application has been recommended for approval subject to conditions. Um, I should state that there's going to be conditions for the side windows if I go to the elevations um, here. So this elevation faces on to number 13, which is this property here. Um, there's a condition requiring this glazing to be of score glaze and on opening. And then this window here uh, faces onto the boundary of the rear garden of number 10 and that's going to be conditioned to be obscure glaze and non-opening um, above sorry below 1.8 meters of the finished floor level um, and that's noted within the committee report thank you thank you Nisha. thank you uh, councillor davis uh, thank you chairman um i just have one concern really about this property is the raised section even though it's under permitted development um I'd be concerned of the waterfall off of that, so any water going into the um, property next door. Is there any way of um, conditioning or putting something in for drainage so that there's a soakaway installed there? Because I, I naturally would say that water would run off of that higher and we've also lost the... I think from that from that, di that picture there, you can see that, that, that it will run off at the end. Yeah, but my concern with that, and Chairman... It's, it's angled at a certain way. So my concern is, Chairman, if it does fall into the property next door, it risks flooding the bottom of their garden. Um, that would be my concern on that because number 10, I believe it is, is very close on the boundary line. So if we could do something there. Okay. We'll Thank you. Off. Officers, would you like to... Sure. Um, whilst I appreciate your concerns, I don't think it would be reasonable to attach such a condition requiring uh, details to do with the surface water um, area. It's such a, compared to the relative size of the garden, that's such a minor area that's been covered in hard standing. And there is still a gap that you can see here that water can run off. So I'm not sure what the concern is because if we're talking about harm in terms of surface water flooding, I would say that I don't think that's a strong enough ground for refusal, and you should only attach conditions um, to address something that may be unreasonable and to make it acceptable. Um, that answered your question. Okay. Any other questions? Anybody want to take me away? Councillor Goyal. Uh, I'd just like to say that um, based on what I've read on this application, I'm happy to go with Oscar's recommendations for approval. I think all the points have been sufficiently, all the conditions have been suffi sufficiently meet the needs and whilst it looks retrospective to me, I'm not too pleased about that. Um, I understand that, uh, I understand that, and from what I understand of the, re of the report, officers have um, adequately covered the basis to um, allow this to happen in a, in a suitable manner. So I'd like to go ahead and propose officers Okay, recommendations. so I'm proposed, Councillor Singh. Uh, I think this is straightforward. I think the officer agreed and things so one second. Okay, you second it. Councillor Davis, you want to do that? Um, I was going to second officer's recommendation. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. Those proposed and second. Can I show hands those in favour of this application? Thank you. That is passed. Thank you, Court. Councillor Cawthorn, for your time this evening. It's much appreciated. Have a safe journey home. Nisha, do you want to do item 10 for me now? Thank you, Chair. Item 10, Pembroke House, 5 to 9 Pembroke Road, Wyslip. Um, the application proposes a minor material amendment to vary condition 2, approved plans attached to Secretary of State's appeal decision reference ending in 3155076, dated 11th of November 2016, and as amended under plan information reference ending in 2018-164. The proposal description is the erection of a detached building to accommodate refuse storage at ground floor and office accommodation above for minor elevation variations, relocation of refuse store and infilling of undercroft to create garage to include the provision of a ground floor WC, first floor WC, shower and kitchen. Um, it's part retrospective. I'm just going to quickly explain what that means because that's a, um, quite a lot of birding. Um, essentially, the office building was approved or allowed at appeal in 2016. 
Um, that permission was subsequently varied under Section 73, which was approved in 2018. The amendments that were approved was changes to the elevations of the building and the relocation of the refuse store um, to a different location on the site and um, to create a garage area of the undercroft area. This current application is only for internal changes. No changes are being made to the dimensions or external appearance of the building, and they solely relate to ground floor WC, first floor WC, and a kitchen. So this is the bird's eye view of the site. Um, it comprises a five-story building that was an office but was, has been converted into flats. This is the office building that's the subject of this planning committee here. Um, the constraints plan, um, you have the conservation area uh, highlighted in orange and then the area special local character, Midcroft, um, highlighted in purple. Um, this is the proposed site plan, so this is the building here. Um, this building was recently approved for a similar application a couple of months ago in June, um, and that was through Section 73 as well. Okay, so this is the proposed site plan, its system ground floor plan. I'm just going to take you to the proposed ground floor plan. So this WC um, and basin has already been installed, so that's the ground floor one. And then as part of this scheme, uh, offices have negotiated two cycle store spaces, and that's to ensure compliance with policy T5 of the London plan. Um, and then at first floor, so this shower and WC exists at the moment and forms part of this application along with the kitchen. We've attached a condition requiring the existing hob and oven to be removed because those go beyond what would be reasonably expected for an office space. Um, and then this is the car parking plan. No changes are being made to the parking layout that was originally approved under the 2018 permission. Um, front elevation of the building, side elevation of the building, a photo of the ground floor, the first floor, the kitchen, the shower room and WC. Um, I think that's it. I just wanted to, there has been uh, objections to this application, primarily relating to the building being used as a self-contained residential unit, and also an objection has also been received by a ward councillor. I did complete a site office sorry, a site visit with the enforcement officer. At the time of the visit, the property was in use as an office. And I would like to emphasize to members that this application does not seek to change the use, the lawful use of the building as an office. Um, the application has been recommended for approval subject to the conditions noted in section two of the committee report. Thank you. Thank you, Anisha, that's thorough. Um, who's gonna take Councillor Gohill? Um, I just noticed one of the in one of the conditions, it's removal of an oven and a hob. It says no other cooking facilities except for a microwave should be contained. Can we allow them to have a kettle, please, Chairman? <laughs> <laughs> that's not that's not under our remit, I'm afraid. But yes, they are allowed to have a kettle. Yes, that's not. We can't. Uh, we could. We could actually specify that microwave cannot have grilling facilities or anything else on it if you wanted. But I think that's a bit a bit going a bit too onerous. But uh, thank you. So, do are you proposing as well? Uh, yes, I am actually. I'm actually quite satisfied with with the way that officers have looked over this um, application. I'm happy to go ahead with officers' recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Thank you, Chairman. Um, no tricky questions for this one. I do have one question though. Um, just to clarify, was the resident informed before our officers visited? If so, how long did we give them? <laughs> That's a very mischievous question. Uh, there was no residence there there is an office building and Nisha herself yep. went so how long how much notice did we give the occupants fine I'll let that up. sure yeah. um, so there is enforcement history relating to this building um, there has been uh, alleged claims that it has been in residential use in the past however as I must emphasize this applications for the lawful use as an office space. We can't get involved in the enforcement side. At the moment, it's not being used as a residential accommodation. And in terms of how much notice, I needed to give the applicants notice because there's a gate to the site. So they needed to let me in. Um, and I would say it's probably about two weeks, Matt, if I can remember off the top of my head. Thank you very much for clarity, Chairman. I am happy to second and go with officers' Thank recommendations. You. 
That's been proposed and seconded. All those in favour of the recommendation? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for tonight. Thank you for the viewers watching. And uh, I bid you a safe journey home. I am really hot. <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant.